Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to the regularly scheduled quarterly meeting of the State Historical Resources Commission. I'm now going to convene the session by hammering this gavel. Uh, today's meeting of the commission has been duly noted and or noticed, and all the agenda items are subject to action by the commission. Um, I'll now ask commissioners, staff, and members of the public to rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So my name is Adam Sriro, and I represent archaeology. Um, I am vice chair normally, but because we are missing a couple of members today, I am chair today. So bear with me, and we'll all get through this together. Um, I'll now ask the commissioners and staff to introduce themselves, and I will start with Commissioner Pretzelis. Hello, I'm Adrian Pretzelis. I'm an archaeologist. I'm from Santa Rosa. Hi, I'm Janet Hansen from Los Angeles, and I represent the history chair on the commission. Uh, Luis Hoyos, I, I represent uh, architectural history. I'm from Los Angeles. Good morning. I'm Rick Moss. I represent ethnic history, and I'm here from San Bernardino. I'd also like to introduce uh, Julie Polanco, who is our State Historic Preservation Officer and Executive Secretary of the Commission. Uh, Ms. Polanco, would you please introduce yourself and members of your staff? Good morning. Well, I'm Julie Polanco. I'm the State Historic Preservation Officer. We have Janon Saunders, our Deputy Shippo, to, the, to my right. Um, our Registration Unit staff, William Berg, Jay Correa, Amy Crane. To the left, our Executive Secretary, Twyla Willis-Hunter. Diane Barkley is in the room with us. Is there anybody else? Oh, that's all. Thank you. So all commissioners have received copies of the draft minutes for the meeting today, and I will entertain comments from the commissioners um, on those minutes, including any proposed additions, deletions, or other revisions. None? Any motion to... Approve the minutes then? I move that we approve the um, October 27th, 2017 minute meetings. I second the motion. Motion has been approved and, or the motion has been given and seconded, right? Okay. Do I hammer? <laughs> we need, Do we vote? We Sorry. Need a, we need a roll call vote. Thank you, Tucker. Okay. Brett Sellis, aye. Hansen, aye. Sriro, aye. Oyus, aye. Moss, aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, we go right into staff reports, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a number of staff reports to present today. Now we go into commission reports. Do you, have a, do you have a report as the chair? I have no report today. Okay, okay. I have a report. Okay. Would you like me to give mine? Please. Okay. Good morning. Um, happy Groundhog Day. Uh, I, I believe it's also the official period where you can give lycee to people that are younger than you for Chinese New Year, so 
Gung Hei Bok Choi. Um, but also I want to say that it's um, our acting chairman's birthday today, so please join me in wishing Adam a happy birthday. Um, we've been busy in the office. Um, we've had lots of consultations going on um, related to, in particular, the emergencies, and um, we've been working with Cal OES, FEMA, Army Corps of Engineers, and others to make sure that we are quickly responding to the many needs of repairs, um, particularly in most recently in the floods in Montecito. So um, that's been going very well, and I have to say that it's um, impressive the um, the cooperation among partners to really to really work together to get these things taken care of for the the folks who've been completely affected by those tragedies. Um, we just renewed the Region 5 U.S. Forest Service PA days before it expired the other day. It was a very big push, and we're happy to have that completed. I and mean, then we just seem to be having lots of really complicated consultations in the office lately um, in very high volumes. Um, but all working well, staff's doing a great job, and we continue to be proud of and impressed by their efforts. Um, some good news on uh, the non-consultation front. We received uh, a grant from the National Park Service and the underrepresented communities grant process for the California missions and working with our tribal partners to create a context statement that will add the layer of history of the missions from the tribal perspective and it'll update one nomination form of a California mission and at the moment we're looking at uh, La Parisima. Um, as you know, we are required to have ownership of, uh, for owner's consent for the nomination and um, State Parks owns La Parisima, so they've happily said that we can, they'd be happy to partner with, with us on that. We are also getting started on the underrepresented communities grant that we received last year um, for the Asian American and Pacific Islander context statement in California. Um, so we're about to, to launch that RFP and help and happily get started on um, getting that document together. Amy Crane will be um, our, our staff point of contact and, and assisting Janon and me on that. So we're really very excited to be working on both of those context statements to, um, to, to get them completed and, and see some more nominations for um, the many layers of our history. Um, on Monday, uh, the Resources Agency, we are in the California Resources Agency building, um, released its climate change document. It's sort of a five-year annual report on climate change and the state of it in California called Safeguarding California. And I am thrilled and pleased to report that the word culture stands out very large and proud in the document um, and in conjunction with Parks and Recreation this year. And we managed to um, successfully insert a section that um, creates a, clim a cultural resources climate change task force for California. So um, the, the envision we're envisioning that we will gather our partners together, our office will be the lead, um, to begin to understand the role that cultural resources plays in climate change and how we can contribute to solutions uh, for California in the next five years. So we're very excited about that. And um, I'm also working on um, a, a submission for the Global Summit in San Francisco in September, the Global Climate Change Summit in San Francisco except in September to get a, a session um, about cultural resources and um, climate change on that um, agenda. So we are um, becoming um, partners in the climate change conversation, which I think is long overdue and a really exciting opportunity for us. Um, and with that, I don't have anything else. Janon, do you have anything? To report, great. That's the extent of our report. Thank you. So we'll now move to PowerPoint presentations. The four-story property at 3543 18th Street, known as the Women's Building, was erected in 1910 of unreinforced masonry. The social hall is located at the southwest corner of 18th and LePage Streets in San Francisco's Mission District. The building is clad in stucco over brick at the north and east facades and bare common bond brick at the south and west facades and is capped by a built-up roof. Maestro piece, the 1994 mural that envelops the building's main facades, is included as a contributing resource. 
Alterations to the interior of the building in the 1930s and 1980s and 90s served to reinforce the building's continued use as a social hall. The property retains all aspects of integrity. The women's building is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places at the national level of significance under criterion A in the areas of social history, women's history and LGBTQ history, and ethnic heritage, Asian, Black, Hispanic, and Native American, for its association with second wave feminism, one of the late 20th century's most consequential social movements. The women's building is one of the first women-owned and women-operated community centers in the United States. Women's centers, which appeared in various forms and occupied a variety of building types across the U.S. in the 1960s and 1970s, were especially important manifestations of this grassroots movement for gender equality and social transformation. The property meets criteria consideration G, properties that have achieved significance within the past 50 years for its association with the nationally significant second wave feminist movement and as a location where the struggle for women's rights was linked to additional community struggles, including those of marginalized racial ethnic communities, LGBTQ people, immigrants, and others. A sufficient body of scholarship has developed to establish second wave feminism as a social movement critical to US history. The women's building is exceptional in this history for the scale of its ambitions and for the breadth of social issues it has addressed. The period of significance for the resource is 1978 to 1994. This period captures the beginnings, formation, and consolidation of the women's building, culminating with the creation of the major mural project, Maestropiece, which visually communicates the organization's mission of supporting and celebrating women across time and around the world. The property is nominated on behalf of the owner. The Historic Preservation Commission, in its role as representative of the City of San Francisco, a certified local government, approved the nomination unanimously at their regular meeting January 17, 2018, and submitted a resolution of recommendation. No other letters have been received to date. Staff supports the nomination as written and recommends the State Historical Resources Commission determine the women's building is eligible under National Register Criterion A at the national level of significance with a 1978 to 1994 period of significance and satisfies criteria consideration G. Coit Memorial Tower, more popularly referred to as Coit Tower, is located at one Telegraph Hill Boulevard in San Francisco. Designed in the Art Deco style by Arthur Brown Jr. as a commemorative monument and observation tower, it was built during the Great Depression, largely financed by a bequest to the city and county of San Francisco from Lily Hitchcock Coit. At a height of 182 feet, the unpainted, reinforced concrete tower is a three-part cylindrical composition, shaft, belvedere, and lantern, that rises from a squared cubic base. The basic form, the fluted shaft, rises to two upper elements that both function as observation decks. Coit Tower is located atop Telegraph Hill within the boundaries of public Pioneer Park. The tower's immediate setting is defined by mature trees and greenery, staircases, terraces and walkways, and views in all directions. Coit Tower's interior walls at the first and second floors and in the winding stairway that connects both floors are covered with 27 murals that comprise a large-scale fresco New Deal art project titled Aspects of Life in California, 1934. Coit Tower retains a high level of integrity. This nomination amends the 2008 National Register nomination to document national level of significance under Criterion C in the area of art. Coit Tower rises to the national level of significance because it is intrinsically associated with the extraordinary permanent exhibition of federally funded art created through the Public Works of Art Project, PWAP. The Coit Tower Mural Project was the single largest PWAP venture in the country and the most ambitious test of whether federally funded arts programs could work. Its success served as a model for an array of New Deal arts programs that followed. The Coit Tower murals possess exceptional value in interpreting the themes of the Great Depression and New Deal idealism and in showcasing the work of 25 of the region's finest artists, including four women. This extensive fresco undertaking is an unusual example of a large group of muralists working in unison. 
The mural's content and expression were directly influenced by Diego Rivera. They comprised the most extensive use of fresco technique up to that time, which until then had been rare. The period of significance, 1933 to 1934, encompasses construction of the tower, completion of the frescoed murals, and public inauguration of the building. Originally designed and intended as a commemorative civic monument, Coit Tower was named in honor of Lily Hitchcock Coit, whose wealth financed its construction. As a property exceptionally significant apart from the value of the person memorialized by the monument, Coit Memorial Tower satisfies criteria consideration F, commemorative properties. The property is nominated by Protect Coit Tower, a citizen's advocacy organization. The Historic Preservation Commission, in its role as representative of the City of San Francisco, a certified local government, approved the nomination unanimously at their regular meeting January 17, 2018, and submitted a resolution of recommendation. 17, actually 18, including a letter received and distributed this morning, additional letters of support have been received to date. Staff supports the nomination as written and recommends the State Historical Resources Commission determine Coit Memorial Tower is eligible under National Register Criterion C at the national level of significance, amending the earlier nomination, with a 1933 to 1934 period of significance and meets criteria consideration F. The San Francisco Central YMCA is a nine-story rectangular Italian Renaissance Revival style athletic fraternal building adapted to provide 174 units of supportive housing to formerly homeless people. Located on the northwest corner of Leavenworth Street and Golden Gate Avenue, the building has formal and regular street facades. The steel-framed building has concrete walls with brick infill. The interior has concrete floor slabs with plaster and gypsum board walls and ceilings. In some locations, suspended acoustic tile ceilings are found. The primary exterior materials are stone, terracotta, brick and cement plaster walls, and wood and metal windows. A large projecting metal cornice caps the masonry exterior. In 2012, a historic preservation certification application was approved for rehabilitation completed in conformance with the Secretary of the Interior standards. The property, already a contributing resource in the National Register listed Uptown Tenderloin Historic District, retains all aspects of integrity. The San Francisco Central YMCA is eligible for individual listing at the local level of significance under Criterion A in the area of social history as the lead branch of the San Francisco Metropolitan YMCA and in the area of education as the birthplace of Golden Gate University, one of a few universities that can tie their origins to the educational programs offered at a local YMCA. <coughs> the period of significance is from construction in 1910 to 1967 when Golden Gate University separated itself from the YMCA and moved to its own location. The building is also individually eligible at the local level of significance under Criterion C in the area of architecture because it embodies the distinctive characteristics of an early 20th century community building for an organization that was evolving along with the society that created it and that it sought to serve. Under Criterion C, the period of significance is 1910, the year construction was completed. The property is nominated on behalf of the owner. The Historic Preservation Commission, in its role as representative of the City of San Francisco, a certified local government, approved the nomination at the regular meeting January 17, 2018, and submitted a resolution of recommendation with minor revisions suggested. No other letters have been received to date. Staff supports the nomination as written and recommends the State Historical Resources Commission determine <coughs> The San Francisco Central YMCA is eligible under National Register Criteria A and C at the local level of significance with a 1910 to 1967 period of significance. The Miles C. Bates House is located on a small lot in an eclectic Palm Desert neighborhood. The building is rectangular in plan with two shallow projecting volumes stepping away to the west. The striking double curve roof, a patented system integrating two wind profiles and clad with a cementos covering, is supported by a modular steel framing system. The frame is exposed where glass is used for window walls or embedded in the concrete walls whose top aligns with the top of the frame. Each of the three walls, one straight and the others curved, runs well beyond the building envelope to engage the landscape. While the rear and side elevations are primarily glass, behind the plywood in the photo on the left, 
The primary facade's walls are opaque except for clerestories, closing the interior to street view. While compromised by two additions and a concrete brick infilling some window walls, the property retains integrity. At the rear of the property, a non-contributing one-story, four-unit apartment building cannot be seen from the street. The Bates House is eligible at the local level of significance under Criterion C in the area of architecture for its high artistic value and in representing an exemplary design by master architect, inventor, and builder Walter S. White. Echoing the profile of the Santa Rosa Mountains in the distance, White's patented roller coaster wood roof system embodies a high mark in innovative thinking in residential modern architecture. Seeking a low-tech means to facilitate a variety of roof shapes, White's system defined a new role for wood, helping to expand concepts of modernism beyond the stereotype of the flat roof or the low-slope gable roof. Additionally, the small house, dense with ideas, exemplifies several degrees of integration that are characteristic of White. The building embodies his lifelong ambition to push architecture in new directions, restlessly searching for solutions that integrated dramatic form making with a pragmatism born of respect for materials and their capabilities amidst the demanding conditions of the desert. The house also shows off White's ability to synthesize a harmonious relationship between common, humble products such as rough-faced concrete masonry units and upscale materials and technologies such as steel and glass sliding window walls and terrazzo floors. In mimicking the profile of the mountain range in the distance, White demonstrates his sensitivity to site and setting. The period of significance is 1955, the year of construction. The property is nominated on behalf of the Historical Society of Palm Desert. Five letters of support have been received to date. Staff supports the nomination as written and recommends the State Historical Resources Commission determine the Miles C. Bates House is eligible under National Register Criterion C at the local level of significance with the 1955 period of significance. The Westminster Presbyterian Church and Cemetery of Tremont, also known as Tremont Church, with an adjoining cemetery, is located on two acres of dry flat land on the south side of Tremont Road in northern Solano County. The tall, one-story church building, constructed in 1871, measures approximately 46 feet long by 28 feet wide. Architecturally, the church is characteristically Greek revival in several respects, neoclassical proportions of length to width, a broad pediment above the entrance, characteristic Greek revival molding around the windows and doors, and a belfry centered over the entrance. The building features two tall windows at the front facade, three on either side elevation, and no windows to the rear. The cemetery is located on the same parcel as the church, situated behind the church building. Minor modifications to the church include construction of a pair of secondary doors just inside the original door, and construction of a balcony, both prior to 1929. A raised foundation was installed in 2014 to replace the original mud sill foundation. The church building and cemetery retain a high degree of integrity. A single wide trailer installed circa 1989 for a resident caretaker is a non-contributing resource. The property is eligible at the local level of significance under Criterion A in the area of exploration settlement for its association with the pioneer history of eastern Solano County and under Criterion C in the area of architecture as a building that embodies the distinctive characteristics of the Greek Revival style as applied to a modest community church. The building is a rare surviving example of volunteer-built 19th century churches in California's Central Valley. The period of significance is 1871 to 1929, from construction until the church was sold following years of little activity. As a property that derives its significance from architectural distinction as evaluated under Criterion C, the building satisfies Criteria Consideration A, Religious Properties. Where the church is the main resource nominated, the associated cemetery does not need to meet Criteria Consideration D, Cemeteries. The property is nominated on behalf of the owner. One letter of support has been received to date. Staff supports the nomination as written and recommends the State Historical Resources Commission determine the Westminster Presbyterian Church and Cemetery of Tremont is eligible under National Register Criteria A and C at the local level of significance with an 1871 to 1929 period of significance and satisfies Criteria Consideration A. The Integratron 
located in Landers, San Bernardino County, also known as the College of Universal Wisdom Research Laboratory, is a circular plan, two-story, hemispherical umbrella dome building, 43 feet in diameter and 33 feet tall. Located on a flat 10-acre parcel in a remote desert setting, the Integratron is the focus of a complex of small operations and maintenance buildings. Constructed of wood, the building is symmetrical and divided into 16 equilateral bays. Every fourth bay contains a pair of wood frame hopper windows. <coughs> the upper and lower levels are separated by a continuous ring of 64 aluminum die rods designed to generate static electricity via spinning motion propelled by jets of compressed air. This static charge is intended to produce negative ions for cellular regeneration, anti-gravity, and time travel. The property is eligible under criteria A, B, and C, with a period of significance of 1956 to 1978. The property is significant under criterion A for its role in the field of UFOlogy, the study of extraterrestrial contact and paranormal activity. Southern California became a locus for the field of UFOlogy in the era following World War II, with many active participants involved in scientific and aerospace fields, who often blurred the line between science and mysticism. The Integratron was intended to facilitate life extension through the use of esoteric teachings passed from extraterrestrial sources to a human contactee, George Wellington Van Tassel. The property is also eligible under Criterion B for its association with George Van Tassel, a significant individual in the field of aerospace research and ufology. Born in Ohio in 1910, he became involved with the aviation field in Cleveland before moving to Los Angeles, circa 1930 to 1933. In the 1930s, he worked for Douglas and Hughes Aircraft. After the war, he moved to the Mojave Desert in San Bernardino County and began his involvement with the paranormal. Beginning in 1950, he organized groups interested in psychic abilities and extraterrestrial contact and reported his own contact with extraterrestrial entities beginning in 1952, specifically beings named Ashtar and Solganda. For the rest of his life, Van Tassel held events, formed organizations, and wrote books considered fundamental to the field of ufology. The property is also eligible under Criterion C as a unique example of architecture and engineering, incomplete at the time of the designer's death, but clearly exhibiting elements of design and craftsmanship inspired by post-World War II dome architecture and aircraft design. During his time at Hughes Aircraft, Van Tassel worked on the experimental D-2 fighter plane, an all-wood aircraft utilizing <coughs> glue laminate or glue lamb wood components. Glue lamb became an important component of the Integratron design due to its high structural strength and the requirement that the Integratron include no metal structural elements to facilitate its role as a static charge generating device. Architect Howard Hess was hired by Van Tassel in 1954 to formalize the design, but it was based on Van Tassel's inspiration and visions. Initial construction was completed in 1958, but Van Tassel continued work on the design for the next 20 years. The Integratron was never completed as an operating machine, but it became a physical focus for Van Tassel's ideas and organizations, and the site is still utilized by ufo ufologists through the present day. The property retains a high degree of historic integrity in all aspects, including contributing secondary buildings and structures, the humidity control room, bi bipolar magnetic detector, control room, workshop, and landscape elements. The property is exceptionally significant due to the pivotal role played by Van Tassel through the end of his life in 1978 within the field of ufology in Southern California, as documented in works about the subject from the period and afterward, and thus meets the requirements of criteria consideration G. The property is nominated on behalf of the property owner. No letters of support or objection have been received. Staff supports the nomination as written and recommends that the State Historical Resources Commission determine the Integratron eligible under criteria A, B, and C at the local <coughs> level of significance with a period of significance of 1956 to 1978, meeting the requirements of criteria consideration G. The Joseph and Carrie Torrey House is a craftsman bungalow constructed in 1911 in Long Beach, Los Angeles County. The two-story building exhibits many features of the craftsman style. Sheathed in clapboard wooden siding and shingles, the primary facade is asymmetrical and has three front-facing gables with exposed rafter tails and beams. 
A series of battered piers rest on heavy cast stone piers supporting the wide porch roof gable. Two bays with shed roofs are located on the southern and rear elevations. Windows are a mixture of double-hung wooden sash with a single pane in each sash and large fixed single pane windows with wooden sash except for three casement windows on the south elevation which have six divided lights above a larger light <laughs> mounted in wooden sash. A cast stone retaining wall is located between the sidewalk and front yard, original to the building and architecturally matching the cast stone of the building foundation, porch, and fireplace. The Tory House is eligible under criteria B and C, with a period of significance from 1911 to 1951. The building was associated with, and built for, Joseph and Carrie Tory, both of whom qualify as locally significant individuals under criteria B associated with the history of Long Beach, California. Carrie Tory was a role model, community leader, philanthropist, and member of multiple benevolent societies and community organizations, and the proprietor of a local business. Joseph Torrey was also a role model, community leader, and philanthropist. Joseph and Carrie migrated from their birthplace in Illinois to Kansas and subsequently to Long Beach. Joseph was a very successful dairy farmer and well known in the local equestrian community, especially for his role in promoting harness racing. Until his death in 1944, Mr. Torrey was known in the community for still using a horse and buggy as his primary form of transportation. Mrs. Torrey remained at the house until her own death in 1951, the end of the period of significance. The property is also eligible under Criterion C as a significant example of craftsman bungalow architecture. While the architect of the Torrey house is unknown, the property exhibits a high degree of craftsmanship and design features that respond to the nearby environment. The two-story design, sometimes considered unusually tall for a craftsman home, provided direct views towards the ocean and the Los Angeles River from its upper stories and sunroom. The property retains a high degree of historic integrity in all aspects, including the building interior. The property is nominated on behalf of the property owner. No letters of support or objection have been received. Staff supports the nomination as written and recommends that the State Historical Resources Commission determine that the Joseph and Carrie Torrey House eligible under criteria B and C at the local level of significance with a period of significance of 1911 to 1951. Staff also recommends the State Historic Preservation Officer approve this nomination and the aforementioned National Register nominations for forwarding to the National Park Service for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. <coughs> Glendale Civic Auditorium, historically known as the Verdugo Municipal Recreation Center, was designed by J.A. Grunfor and constructed in 1938 with funding from the Works Progress Administration. The auditorium is a one- and two-story building over a raised basement, designed in the Spanish colonial revival style with Moorish influence. The building has an approximately rectangular plan. Exterior walls are board-formed concrete. It has a series of flat roofs with parapets, flanked by hipped shed roofs over the north and south facades, clad in mission tile with open eaves. A decorative Moorish-style geometric pattern is cast into the cornices. Fenestration consists of steel stash casement windows. The building has undergone alterations over time, including the addition of an arcade facing the street, but retains substantial integrity of its original design, sufficient for California register listing. The property is eligible under California Register Criterion 1 in the area of community planning and development associated with the growth of Glendale in the late 1930s through the mid-1960s. In 1965, the property was reopened after a major renovation and renamed to its current title, Glendale Civic Auditorium. Other alterations were completed during the property's period of significance, reflecting the city of Glendale's continued investment in the auditorium as an important part of civic life. Funded in part by the Federal Works Progress Administration during the Great Depression, the building's construction method of board form concrete is indicative of WPA architecture, but instead of the more common WPA modern architectural style commonly associated with these buildings, J.A. Grunfor applied a Spanish colonial revival interpretation to the exterior. The design was intended to reflect the surrounding Ross Moyne subdivision, whose second phase, opened in 1926, was meant to be reminiscent of a Spanish village in architectural style. The Great Depression halted the growth of Ross Moyne until 1936, when a new expansion was proposed named Ross Moyne Village. <coughs> the city of Glendale received WPA federal assistance construct to construct the recreation hall and an adjacent municipal swimming pool, which was since demolished. Despite cost overruns, the city of Glendale provided funding to complete the project in 1938. <coughs> 
The venue was instantly popular with the community and became an intrinsic part of Glendale civic life, hosting more than 300 events each year. The property is nominated by the property owner, the city of Glendale. Three letters of support have been received. Staff supports the nomination as written and recommends that the State Historical Resources Commission determine that the Glendale Civic Auditorium is eligible for listing in the California Register under Criterion 1 at the local level of significance with a period of significance of 1938 to 1965 and list the property in the California Register of Historical Resources. This concludes the consent calendar portion of the agenda. Thank you, Amy and Bill. Um, the Commission will now hear nominations and any comments concerning the eligibility of the nominated properties for the National Register of Historic Places, the California Register of Historical Resources, and the State Landmarks Program, and California Points of Historical Interest. Based on the evidence presented, including the nomination and any comments received regarding the nomination and the nominated properties, including testimony presented at this meeting, the Commission will determine whether the property or properties meets the criteria of the applicable register program. For nominations to the National Register of Historic Places, the Commission will then make a recommendation of the State Historic Preservation Officer regarding forwarding the nominations to the Keeper of the National Register of Historic Places for action by the Keeper. For nominations to the California Register of Historical Resources, the Commission's determination on such nominations shall be final. Nominations approved by the Commission for State Landmarks and California Points of Historical Interest are formally designated by the Director of California State Parks. The Commission only considers evidence relating, to specifically, relating specifically to the applicable register criteria and not any social or economic matters related to a nomination or a nominated property. All properties that are listed or determined eligible for listing in the National Register are automatically listed in the California Register as well. Furthermore, all properties listed in the California Registered Historical Landmark Program, including and following landmark number 770, are automatically listed in the California Register of Historical Resources. The Commission will first nominations that are on the consent calendar, which we have. Uh, such nominations are on the consent calendar because the Office of Historic Preservation is aware is not aware of any opposition to the nominations. Information concerning nominations on the consent calendar has been forwarded to each commissioner um, and is on file at the Office of Historic Preservation. Unless a member of the audience or a commissioner requests that the nomination um, on the consent calendar be withdrawn, the commission will not hear any testimony on the nominations and will vote on consent calendar nominations in a single motion. If a nomination is withdrawn from the consent calendar, the Commission will hear testimony and consider such nomination later in the meeting. Um, the opponents will then have 20 minutes to present evidence. Wait, did I miss one? Oh, yep, yep. Um, thank you. <laughs> is there any member of the audience that requests a nomination be withdrawn from the consent calendar? at this point. Oh, is there any commissioner that requests a nomination be withdrawn from the consent calendar? Is there any commissioner that wishes to recuse him or herself from hearing the consent calendar? No. Nope. Is there a motion at this point? I move to approve the consent calendar as presented. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion on the motion? No. Nope. Roll call vote, please. Uh, Pretzelis, aye. Hanson, aye. Sriro, aye. Oyes, aye. Moss, aye. And um, are there any members of the audience who wish to speak about one of the properties just approved on the consent calendar? So motion oh. passed five to zero. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. Um, Emily Rowe, on behalf of the Westminster Presbyterian Church. I am here today to thank you for considering the Westminster Presbyterian Church of Tremont. It's been a love life of all of our lives to have this church down the road from an area that in those days, the women 
that started it, I should, I'm backing up a little bit, they built this church in the middle of the flat plains of northern Solano County, and you would just see this clump of trees across the fields, and amazingly, it's still there today, even with less buildings around, just undisturbed through the 150 years it's been there. But I'm the reason it's really important to, I think, unique in its nomination is that it was based on a group of women, pioneer women, that arrived in the area in the 18, been there in the 1850s, 60s, and they formed a group called the Tremont Mite Society. And they wanted a church near their homes rather than going 10 miles by buggy to somewhere else that they could worship. So based on those women, they formed this group and they raised the money and they had it built and they actually continued themselves being responsible for the church for 60 years until they couldn't handle it anymore and it was turned over to the, or sold to the um, Silverville Cemetery District. But we thank you very much for, we feel it's been a very unique building, uh, certainly a classic style and all which we're proud of, but its origin and its places in history, and we present, thank you very much for preserving it in today. I believe it's Dana Graves for the women's building. Thank you, commissioners and staff. I'm Donna Graves, an independent public historian and author of the nomination. I want to thank you for your support, and I'm really happy to be here as this nomination moves forward. The women's building came onto my radar during the two years I worked with Shane Watson on the citywide historic context statement for LGBTQ history in San Francisco. It seemed that everywhere I turned in the archives or when I listened to someone tell me their stories, I was learning about important events and organizations that met at the women's building. When I shared my preliminary findings with the National Park Service, they realized that supporting this nomination would help them move further towards their goal of, quote, telling all American stories. A primary reason I was so passionate about developing this nomination was seeing how a single place could connect to multiple histories. In this case, every letter of LGBTQ, all of San Francisco's racial and ethnic communities, immigrants, people who have been or are incarcerated, artists, and nearly every progressive political movement of the last 40 years. I was surprised when I reviewed the National Register listings and found that there's almost no recognition of second wave feminism as an important element in US history. Prominent historians Linda Gordon and Rosalind Bax Baxendahl described the feminist moment as, excuse me, the largest social movement in the history of the United States. Like a river overflowing its banks and seeking a new course, it permanently altered the landscape. As I'm sure we'd all agree, our society was shaped profoundly by the generation of women who founded institutions like the Women's Building. What I've found so amazing about this building is how those women deliberately linked struggles for women's rights to those of other communities. As Roma Guy, one of the Women's Building's founders, recalled to me, quote, we understood that we can't have real social change for women unless we connect with all people's issues, because women are everywhere. Thank you again for supporting this nomination to recognize an important place in the history of our state and our nation. Thank you, Donna. Catherine Petron for Coitel. Good morning, honorable commissioners, um, Ms. Polanco, esteemed staff. Um, my name is Catherine Petron, and I'm pleased to be here today um, with regard to Coit Tower. 
this project was initiated by Protect Coit Tower, an advocacy group made up of citizens. Um, the nomination was prepared by me with contributed research and rigorous review by John Gollinger and Bob Cherney, Professor Emeritus uh, from San Francisco State. Um, by way of background, just a little bit of explanation for the, the need for the project. Um, uh, I'll say that in 2008, Coit Tower was listed on the National Register under Criterion C for architectural merit at the state level of significance. Um, the nomination contained some omissions and errors, and most notably, the site was listed at the state level of significance um, rather than national, which was a, a bit perplexing to some of us at the time. We felt it was important to correct the record and to address various other inaccuracies. It's really the murals at Coit Tower that elevate the importance of the site to the national level of significance. Um, we believe the murals possess exceptional value in interpreting the themes of the Depression and New Deal idealism. Uh, there's some basic differences between the 2008 nomination and the amendment before the commission today. Um, these are really that there's a much more uh, well-developed social and political context. Um, there's more biographical information um, on each of the individual artists. And there's a more rigorous significance argument. Um, um, and although I don't equate length um, in itself as indicative of quality, um, the, the uh, amendment before the commission is 60 62 pages, um, as opposed to the previous nomination, which was 10. Um, and it also really, I have to say, benefits from um, the review of OHP staff. So I really commend and thank the, the staff for that uh, review. Um, the nomination also benefits from new information um, uh, provided by Professor Cherney. He has recently completed a book on one of the principal uh, artists of the project, Victor Arnatoff. Um, and we were happy to include that in the nomination. And just a note of historical background, uh, Coit Tower was originally intended to be undecorated. Uh, the murals came about as a result of the government's efforts to employ citizen artists during the Depression through the Public Works of Art project, which was only, I was somewhat surprised to learn, a seven-month project uh, from December 1933 to June 1934. But it was the first New Deal project to employ artists and to fund public arts projects. Um, as we heard from staff, um, Coit Tower's interior murals represent the largest collection of federally funded art crea created under the program, and it's an extensive fresco undertaking, which is unusual. The Coit Tower group included some of the most well-known Western artists of the day, including Otis Oldfield, Ralph Stackpole, and Bernard Zackheim. Most of the artists painted entirely on location, directly onto the concrete walls of Coit Tower in the fresco technique, and five of the artists, Stackpole, Bernard Zackheim, Maxine Albro, Clifford White, and Victor Arnatoff, had worked previously in fresco in Mexico along Diego, alongside Diego Rivera. Um, nationally, and between 1934, 1933 and 34, the PWPA uh, engaged more than 3,000 artists across the nation to beautify public buildings and uh, um, with figurative murals and other artworks depicting everyday life. Uh, the mural at Coit Tower remains the largest single PWP project in the country and was the most high profile and ambitious test of federally funded arts programs of its time. Um, its success served as a model for the array of New Deal arts programs that followed. Um, and in closing, we just note that the building retains extremely high levels of integrity on the interior and exterior, and Protect Coit Tower hopes to pursue national historic landmark for the tower in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I believe Julie had some additional introductions she would like to make. I would. I was remiss. I apologize in introducing our chief counsel, Tara Lynch, and our um, parks lawyer and, his, and uh, Katie Cotter, who's in the audience. So, All right. the commission will now hear those nominations to the National Register of Historic Places, the California Register, State Landmarks, and California Points of Interest. 
that are discussion and action items on the agenda. Information concerning the nominations has been forwarded to each commissioner prior to this meeting and is on file at the Office of Historic Preservation. The commission will first hear the Office of Historic Preservation report regarding the nomination. Uh, then the commission will hear testimony from proponents to the nomination and then opponents to the nomination. The proponents will have 20 minutes to present evidence and argument to the commission. The opponents will then have 20 minutes to present evidence and argument to the commission. As such, each side should determine how to allocate its time amongst all speakers. The proponents and opponents will each have five minutes for rebuttal. I'll then close the public comment and allow the commissioners to discuss the nomination. I, I again remind all speakers that the commission only considers evidence relating specifically to the applicable register criteria and not any social or economic matters related to a nomination or a nominated property. So before we proceed, I'd like to know if there is any commissioner that wishes to either recuse or disclose any information regarding the nominations. Uh, yes, with regard to the Lake Narconian Club, uh, historic district amendment, I did have a brief telephone conversation with Bill Wilkman, who is the preparer of that nomination. We'll now go with staff reports. We'll begin with the Napa County Infirmary. The Napa County Infirmary Historic District consists of three hospital and dormitory buildings arranged facing a crescent-shaped drive. The district is located on the north side of Old Sonoma Road, roughly 1.5 miles southwest of downtown Napa. The mixed-use neighborhood lies just east of State Route 29 and is characterized by modest single-family residences, most of which were constructed over the course of the 20th century. The historic district itself has four contributing resources, including the men's building on the left, the hospital in the middle, and the women's building on the right, and the Crescent Drive. The Crescent Drive is landscaped with grass and a row of trees. The district retains all seven aspects of historic integrity. Constructed in 1912 and 1934, the buildings represent Napa County's need to bring its only public charitable institution up to date in order to meet the needs of a growing indigent population and conform to changing institutional standards in the 20th century. The district is an excellent local example of two important architectural trends, cottage plan institutional development and the use of reinforced concrete in building construction. All three buildings were purpose built for use by the infirmary during the period of significance. Napa County Infirmary Historic District is eligible for the National Register at the local level of significance under criteria A and C. The district is significant under criterion A for its association with the development of Napa County's government institutions, specifically social services. The period of significance begins in 1912 with the construction of the two reinforced concrete dormitory buildings flanking the main buildings on the site. The period of significance ends in 1962 when the institution ceased to function as a county infirmary after state and federal assistance programs lessened the need for locally funded medical care. The historic district is also eligible under criterion C at the local level for its architecture. The three buildings in crescent-shaped landscape feature are linked by plan and use and form a physical record of early 20th century institutional architecture. It's 1912 and 1934 buildings designed by renowned local architect W.H. Corlett and constructed by E.W. Dowdy and E.W. Arnitz represent a very early use of technologically innovative reinforced concrete and are the first regional examples of a progressive cottage plan institution. They are also excellent examples of Corlett's ability to blend utilitarian considerations such as fireproof construction and cost consciousness with a aesthetically distinctive buildings. The property is nominated on behalf of Napa County Landmarks. The County of Napa, the public owner of the building, objects to the nomination because the county has declared the property surplus and is negotiating sale of the property with the goal of creating affordable housing and has invested resources to analyze options for the site. In 2013, the county concluded environmental review under CEQA and adopted a statement of overriding considerations, quote, for impacts associated with the resource, unquote. The county states that listing the property at this stage will create confusing and false expect public expectations. 
Staff supports the nomination as written and recommends the State Historical Resources Commission determine the Napa County Infirmary eligible under National Register criteria A and C at the local level of significance with a period of significance from 1912 to 1962. Staff recommends the State Historic Preservation Officer, the State Historic uh, Resources Commission approve the nomination for forwarding to the National Park Service for listing in the National Register. The County of Napa has informed um, OHP that they will not be attending the meeting, but uh, we were extra certain to read, you know, portions of their letter of objection, so. Is there any public comment on the Napa Infirmary? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a speaker slip for you. I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't arrive in time to fill out a speaker card, but um, I think staff knew I was coming. But my name is Kara Brunzel uh, of Brunzel Historical, and I prepared the form on behalf of Napa County Landmarks. So I just wanted to um, you know, th thank you, C Chair and Commissioners, for allowing me to speak for a minute. Um, staff has done a thorough job of uh, highlighting the main aspects of this property, which is so important to Napa history and to uh, uh, the people of Napa. Uh, it is a very early use of reinforced concrete. It's the first use in the region of the cottage plan progressive institutional design, which was later adopted by larger institutions like the Napa Asylum. And it is Napa County's first public charity, uh, one of its very first medical institutions, its first public hospital, and that all that occurred on that site. And we also have a very interesting landscape element that goes back to the 1870s. So it's an extraordinarily unique site with a lot of things coming together to make it significant. So I, I hope the commission will send it on to the keeper for action. Thank you. If there's no more public comment, um, on the infirmary, I'll close the public comment period and ask if there's any discussion from commission. Yeah, I just had a, since we, um, we the, there's a letter in the file from the uh, uh, Napa County about this. And I just wanted to um, ask uh, our legal person, um, what's the, what if any is the nexus between a CEQA document and the commission's responsibility to make a recommendation of, of the eligibility of, uh, of the property. Is there, a, is there any relationship there? Can you repeat the question? I just want to make sure I understand it. Sure. Well, the County of Napa makes a big deal about having gone through the CEQA process on this. And I'm wondering, is there, is there a relationship between them having gone through the CEQA process and the function of this commission, which is essentially to make a determination as to whether the, the property appears eligible? Thank you. They're independent processes. So, I mean, this action and consideration by the commission is not affected by that. And, and, and I mean, so, so it, they're just independent processes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other discussion from the commission? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have brief uh, comments. I, I, I thought the nomination was, uh, was well written and well presented and the arguments uh, contained therein are convincing, especially in the area of, uh, of the, 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 uh, the, the, the district's merits in terms of the application of site planning ideas surrounding the cottage plan which uh, in other resources that we've considered here, uh, yes, it tracks back to the 1870s to the, to the Frederick Law Olmsted 
practice uh, and, and, and had tremendous um, influences uh, statewide and, and indeed in, in the West. And then in the, in the area of architectural merit, uh, I, I found the ar arguments likely uh, also uh, convincing. It's an early example of concrete architecture and, uh, and it's a very good example of the, of the, uh, of the practice of, the, of uh, Mr. Corlett. Thank you. Is there a motion? I move that the uh, commission find the uh, Lake Norconia, oh, sorry, <laughs> later. <laughs> I move that the uh, Napa County Infirmary um, in, um, uh, in Napa County uh, be found eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Is there a second? I would second. Roll call. Brett Silas, aye. Hansen, aye. Sriro, aye. Oyes, oh, aye. Moss, aye. Motion carries 5 0. Great. Uh, we'll now continue with the next staff report. Lake Norconian Club Historic District, located in Norco, Riverside County, is a 92-acre property consisting of seven contributing buildings, five contributing resources, and one contributing site. The property was originally listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2000, eligible under criteria A and C, with a period of significance of 1928 to 1941. The property was originally developed as a recreational resort, the Norconian Club and Hotel, designed by G. Stanley Wilson and Dwight Gibbs, and significant for its role as a country resort and for its Spanish colonial revival architecture. The period of significance for the existing district ended when the property was acquired by the United States Navy for use as a naval hospital prior to America's entry in the Second World War. This amendment expands the areas of significance of the nomination to include the property's role as a naval base, including its role as hospital and facility for the testing and development of guided missiles, adding the areas of significance health and medicine, military history, social history, and architecture for some of the Navy-era buildings. The amendment also extends the period of significance to 1965. The geographic expansion via amendment increases the district's area to approximately 322 acres, including all portions of the original base that retain historic integrity, including 23 new contributors, 18 buildings, one site, and four structures, and 113 non-contributors, 95 buildings, one site, and 17 structures. The geographic expansion includes the California Rehabilitation Center, owned by the California Department of Corrections, and Norco College, a state junior college, both of which are located on former portions of the base deaccessioned by the Navy and whose ownership currently rests with departments of the state of California. The new contributing properties include buildings and structures constructed between 1943 and 1957 by the Navy to support hospital and laboratory operations, and the southwest landscape of the former resort, a contributing site. The non-contributing properties include Navy properties not associated with historic events, ineligible due to loss of historic integrity, or those created after the end of the period of significance by the Navy, the California Rehabilitation Center, and Norco College. The expanded areas of significance under Criterion A include health and medicine at the national level of significance due to the property's association with treatment and medical research into tuberculosis, poliomyelitis, cord bladder injuries, and rheumatic fever. Its resort-based spa and sports facilities were used for rehabilitation, including the development of wheelchair basketball. Its eligibility in the area of social history at the local level of significance is based on the property's role with and effects upon the communities of Corona and Norco, including the Navy base's leadership in ending segregation and eliminating the influence of the Ku Klux Klan in these nearby communities. In the area of military history at the local level of significance, the property is associated with the establishment of the first fully independent guided missile evaluation system, the Fleet Missile Systems and Evaluation Group, or FMSEG. 
In the area of architecture at the local level under Criterion C, the property is a rare surviving example of World War II naval hospital architecture, including buildings characteristic of standardized World War II naval hospital design and individual buildings designed by master architect Claude Bielman, who was commissioned to create Spanish colonial revival buildings for the base that matched the style of the original Norconian resort. The property, today known as Naval Weapon Station Seal Beach Detachment Corona, was surveyed in evaluation by environmental consultant ASM Affiliates in 2010 as part of compliance with Section 106 and 110 of the National Historic Preservation Act, initiated by the United States Navy, the property owner of record. The draft study examined 73 buildings, structures, and landscape features belonging to the Navy within the 247 acres of the property, still retained. The draft survey found only one additional property, Building 300, eligible for listing in the National Register, and found the remaining 72 not eligible for listing. The final version of this survey, released in September 2011, maintained this position. In response to public comment by the City of Norco and members of the community, a 2013 amendment was written to include evaluation of portions of the property that had been transferred to the California Department of Corrections that were not included in the Section 106 survey, which had been limited, limited to current Navy properties. This evaluation considered the eligibility of the Naval Hospital and Weapons Evaluation Program. Naval Hospital history research focused on the property's role as a tuberculosis sanitarium. ASM's conclusion was that the property was not significant because it was not the largest naval hospital in Southern California, smaller than Bal Balboa Naval Hospital. In addition, the property was not eligible in the area of medicine for its role in tuberculosis research because only one study on the effects of streptomycin on tuberculosis was conducted, and tuberculosis was a minor medical issue for the Navy during World War II. The 2013 addendum to the 2011 evaluation characterized it as a non-factor in the spectrum of health risks and casualties that tuberculosis ranked 18th on the list of non-injury conditions that caused the greatest loss of manpower during World War II. In fact, the occurrence of tuberculosis in the Navy and Marine Corps was lower than in the civilian population during the same period. This evaluation also determined that the guided missile research and development at Corona was not significant because the labs supported research and development and testing and evaluation, known as RTDNE, at other sites rather than being conducted on the site and found its role minimal compared to integrated laboratories including Michelson, Ames, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Lawrence Laboratory. The research buildings at Corona were not purpose-built for missile research, like the integrated labs at Point Magoo and China Lake, and thus not eligible. The 2013 addendum evaluated several of Claude Bielman's properties and determined them ineligible, although in some cases the architects of the Bielman design buildings on the base were identified as not known in the survey documents. The 2011 evaluation identified a potential historic district from the Naval Hospital period, including the architecture of Claude Beeman, the, but the report determined that the property did not retain sufficient historic integrity from the period of significance due to subsequent alteration of the buildings and the introduction of later non-contributing buildings that detracted from the overall integrity of the potential district. The survey also indicated that bu the buildings designed by Beeman were not eligible as they were minor works designed outside the height of his career and in a style that was not the one he typically practiced in. The California Office of Historic Preservation concurred with the findings of the Section 106 evaluations based on the information as presented. However, a finding of ineligibility does not preclude a later finding of eligibility, nor does it preclude nominating properties to the National Register if the later evaluation or nomination provides new information regarding the significance and or historic integrity of the property. The, amended, the amendment to the Lake Norconian Club historic district nomination was written in order to address the concerns raised about significance and integrity by the ASM Section 106 evaluation. As such, the nomination includes additional historic context information and historic integrity evaluation, documented below. Under Criterion A in the area of medicine, the amendment illustrates that there were several properties throughout the United States that were converted from re resorts to naval hospitals, but the Lake Norconian property represents a unique example of this property type because of its higher level of historic integrity compared to other properties of its type. This was due to the temporary construction of most of these bases, while the naval hospital at Norconian was constructed as a permanent facility and a standalone naval hospital, not a component of a larger naval installation. The applicant also suggests that Naval Hospital Coronia is the only surviving example of a naval hospital built as an expansion of a resort that survives and retains its integrity to its World War II form, and the only property of its type converted to a general hospital versus convalescent hospitals, aka special naval hospitals.
The doctors assigned to the Naval Hospital included a significant concentration of doctors who had previously worked at the famed Mayo Clinic, the largest contingent of Mayo doctors ever assembled outside the Mayo Clinic itself. The nomination expands information about the property's role in tuberculosis treatment, explaining that Naval Hospital Corona was the central hospital in the Pacific Theater for medical research and treatment of tuberculosis with its own self-contained hospital within the campus in order to isolate tuberculosis patients from the rest of the hospital. This campus was heavily used and often subject to overcrowding, requiring relocation of tuberculosis patients to other wards and expansion of the tuberculosis unit to other hospital wards as, as the war went on. In addition, to the previously mentioned research regarding streptomycin. Experiments using, using penicillin as a treatment for tuberculosis were also conducted. The failure of the experiments using streptomycin as a treatment highlight their importance. These conclusions allowed researchers to explore other avenues of treatments. The amendments also details the hospital's research into the treatment of rheumatic, rheumatic fever and poliomyelitis and was the Navy's central hospital for medical research into these diseases. Naval Hospital Corona also served as a center for medical rehabilitation following wartime injuries and wounds, and part of its selection for this purpose was the already extant recreational and sports facilities of the Lake Norconian Club Resort. Many of the spa and athletic facilities were adapted for rehabilitation and physical fitness to limit muscular atrophy associated with inactivity due to injury recovery. Cord bladder issues, complications from spinal injuries that disrupt bladder function, were another area of specialty at Navy Hospital Corona, functioning as the Pacific Theater's naval center for this type of injury due to their well-developed physical therapy program. Because of the hospital's specialization in wound recovery related to spinal injuries, a significant number of patients were confined to wheelchairs. While it is unclear whether wheelchair basketball was developed at Naval Hospital Corona, the hospital is nationally significant under criteria in A for the com combined sport and rehabilitation technique of wheelchair basketball developed at the site. The nomination identifies wheelchair basketball events taking place at Naval Hospital Corona in 1945, a year before other documentation identified the beginning of the sport as 1946 in hospitals including Birmingham Veterans Hospital in Van Nuys, Cushing Veterans Hospital in Massachusetts, and um, Naval Hospital Corona. The nomination details the development of this combination sport and rehabilitation strategy at the nominated property. The nomination outlines the influence of the naval facility in race relations in the adjacent communities of Corona and Norco. Previously a regional stronghold of the Ku Klux Klan and places where segregation of businesses and public facilities was practiced against African American and Latino members of these communities. After an incident when an African American serviceman wounded at Pearl Harbor was refused service at local cafes, the executive officer of Naval Hospital Corona, Captain Leslie Marshall, announced that the town would be off limits to the Navy unless these policies were eliminated. In response, the communities ended many of these economic practices rather than lose the economic power of Navy personnel and the local economy. Although this incident did not end discrimination in these communities, per the nomination, it put a major dent in the attitudes and practices of the community and moved the race relations needle significantly in the direction of tolerance and acceptance. Under Criterion C in the area of architecture, the amendment describes the involvement of architect Claude Bielman, a master architect whose National Register listed work in Southern California includes the Pacific Electric Building, Roosevelt Building, Board of Trade Building, Woodbury University, Superior Oil Company, and California Bank Building between 1908 and 1961. These buildings were rendered in many architectural styles, including classical revival, art deco, streamlined modern, and international modern. His designs for the hospital at Lake Narconian were his only major commission in Spanish colonial revival style and were intended to coordinate with the existing Narconian resort's architecture. Bielman's editions often use simplified expressions of Spanish colonial revival styles, possibly due to the expediences of wartime construction, but they were constructed as purpose-designed permanent buildings, not temporary or standardized military buildings. Bielman's continued career following World War II into the 1960s also challenges the assumption that he was an architect at the end of his career at the time of his designs for the Naval Hospital. Regarding historic integrity, 
The revised boundary includes the areas formerly utilized by the Navy from 1942 to 65 that still have sufficient historic integrity for listing. Former base portions that lacked historic integrity were excluded from the revised district boundary. A large number of small, non-contributing buildings and structures are now located within the boundaries of the property, but the property retains sufficient historic integrity as a district to remain eligible for National Register listing. The base buildings designed by Bielman retain sufficient historic integrity to convey their significance for, for the Navy's period, both as Spanish colonial revival architecture and purpose-designed naval hospital buildings. Comparison of historic and contemporary area view, aerial views demonstrate how the property retains historic integrity overall, even if some portions of the property have lost some integrity of materials, design, and workmanship due to subsequent alteration and introductions of new buildings. The applicant has included sufficient analysis of the properties nominated in the amendment, both an analysis of individual buildings and overall integrity of the district to justify an evaluation that the district retains sufficient historic integrity for listing under the expanded context provided. Because the property is owned by stu two State of California agencies, in addition to the United States Navy, the nomination is to be reviewed by the State Historical Res Resources Commission and, if approved, is then forwarded to the State Historic Preservation Officer. And from there, to the U.S. Navy Federal Preservation Officer, who, they, who serve as dual signatories on the nomination. If both SHPO and FIPO sign the nomination, it will then be forwarded to the Keeper of the National Register for considering station of listing in the National Register of Historic Places. The nomination was submitted by the City of Norco, a certified local government. Three letters of opposition were received from property owners, including one from the California Department of Corrections and two letters from the Navy, one from NAVFAC Southwest historians Alex Bethke and Dave Sproul, and one from Captain N.J. Dalkey, Commanding Officer, Naval Weapons Station, Seal Beach. Letters of support from 18 individuals and organizations have been received as of this writing. This total include two pairs of letters set, sent by the Lake Norconian Club Foundation and the City of Norco. The latter prepared by nomination preparer Bill Wilkman, responding individually to the letters by CDCR and NAVFAC. CDCR's reasons for objection include potential effects on ongoing prison operations at the facility and a claim that the application did not include supporting documenta sufficient supporting documentation as to its merits, including recognition of changes to the property since acquisition by CDCR. The Navy analysis includes multiple critiques of the nomination, claiming that the proposed district does not retain integrity due to the low percentage of contributors. Navy analysis characterizes the inclusion of 13 major themes discussed in the amendment as a misapplication of NPS criteria that confuses historical function and existence for significance. The nomination's ending of period of significance is critiqued for an apparently arbitrary ending date of 1965 as a way to avoid having to address criteria consideration G, and claims that the ratio of contributors to non-contributors, 23 to 113, or 20%, is enough to disqualify its consideration as a district. The nom Navy also stated that the nomination does not ask or answer the so what question, but instead makes the argument that everything is significant, thereby rendering nothing significant. In regards to the role that the Navy played in the history of Norco, Navy staff claim that there is no Navy property in the Southwest eligible for its local significance, and that the nomination dilutes the idea of significance to the point of meaninglessness, because federal military operations in small municipalities during World War II were the very definition of ubiquitous. The Navy evaluation reiterates the conclusion of their 2010-2013 Section 106 evaluation that only the properties outlined by that report are eligible historic properties. The response also references a Department of Defense mem Memorandum of Understanding wherein the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation agreed to resolve the cumulative adverse effect of demolishing any remaining World War II temporary buildings and accept preservation of a pre-selected number of those buildings as mitigation for any potential adverse effects. In response to CDCR, potential effects of listing on future prison operations are outside the scope of evaluation for National Register eligibility. Regarding supporting documentation, the amendment document includes 262 pages of property descriptions, historic context statements, photos, charts, and maps, representing a very lengthy document for a nomination of this type, so no additional documentation was deemed necessary. Regarding historic integrity, the nomination includes detailed analysis of historic integrity both with individual property descriptions for each contributor and overall assessments for integrity of the district. 
In response to the Navy analysis, staff does not agree with their critique. Regarding integrity, there is no set percentage of contributors within a district required for eligibility. The, the contributors are primarily large buildings, while the non-contributors are primarily small buildings and structures, and aerial views demonstrate that the property retains sufficient signif significant integrity for listing. The 13 major themes presented in Section 8 fall under four established areas of significance, health and medicine, military history, social history, and architecture. And it is not unusual for large and complex properties to include many areas of significance under different criteria. The Navy analysis, uh, staff believes, also misinterprets the meaning of local significance, possibly confusing the level of significance of a property with its role within community history. There is no specific prohibition on Navy properties being eligible at the local level of significance or being associated with the history of the community. The vast majority, 90% of properties listed in the National Register, are listed at the local level of significance. So patterns of, patterns of events and particular events significant to the local community may be considered significant. Military bases in small towns during World War II could be considered ubiquitous, but the events that played out in each of those towns were unique to the specific time, place, and individuals of each locality, the very definition of local significance. The district amendment as presented provides detailed descriptions of properties and the district. The MOA between ACHP and the Department of Descents is not relevant to the eligibility of resources identified in a nomination. As with the CDCR letter, potential effects on future projects of these properties is not within the scope of evaluation for National Register eligibility. In summary, staff supports the nomination as written and recommends the State Historical Resources Commission support the determination that this amendment demonstrates the Lake Norconian Historic District is eligible under National Register criteria A, B, are A and C in the areas of health and medicine, military history, social history, and architecture with a period of significance of 1929 to 1965 with an overall level of significance at the national level. Staff further recommends the State Historic Preservation Officer approve the amendment for forwarding to the Federal Preservation Officer, United States Navy, for subsequent forwarding by the Navy FPO to the National Park Service for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. This concludes the staff report. Thank you, Bill. Um, due to the fact that we have four missing commissioners, if one of us gets up, we no longer have a quorum. So I'd like to ask if the commission would appreciate a five minute break before we get into public comment. Okay. All right, we're gonna take five minutes, everybody. All right, that concludes that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Thank you for coming. We're going to start with the public comment period. Uh, proponents will have 20 minutes. That will be followed by oppositions, 20 minutes, and then five minute rebuttal each. Um, Bill Wilkman will begin. Okay. Good morning, honorable uh, chairman, commissioners, and, and esteemed staff. My name is Bill Wilkman, and I've been the City of Norco's Cultural Resources Consultant for 10 years. I'm proud to represent the small town of Norco in what really has amounted to a David and Goliath battle. I have 20 years' experience and evaluated over 50 properties. Here with me today are two members of the, of the Norco Historic Preservation Community. Sue Bacon represents the Lake Norconia Club Foundation, a nonprofit whose mission is the preservation of the, of the Norconian property. Sue was actively involved in a lawsuit against the State Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, CDCR, for its negligence in allowing the Norconian, the National Reg Registered List in Norconian Hotel Building to fall into serious disrepair subsequent to its abandonment by the prison in 2002. Kevin Bash is a Norco City Councilman and has been invaluable in providing me with research materials. To date, we have received 18 letters of support for our nomination. We are particularly proud to have the support of former SHPO and ACHP Chairman Wayne Donaldson and former SHPO Knox Mellon. We are also pleased to have the support of OHP staff. 
And then just this morning, we received a letter of support, an enthusiastic letter of support from Commander William Lopper, officer in charge of Detachment Corona from 2006 to 2010. You should have this letter uh, at, on your desk at this time. As you're all aware, the Norconia property began life as a luxury resort in 1929. In 1941, it was converted into a naval hospital. In 1951, a guided missile laboratory was established in part of the property. And in 1962, the balance of the property was transferred to the state of California for a conversion to a prison. In the year 2000, the property's resort improvements were listed on the National Register as the Lake Narconian Club Historic District. And this nomination, by the way, was prepared by Dr. Knox Mellon. The nomination before you seeks to expand this district to encompass its Naval Hospital and Guided Missile Evaluation histories. My work on this project began with a survey and evaluation completed in 2015 and was followed up with the present nomination submitted to OHP in November of 2016. The Norconian is a large and very complex property. I spent literally two years full time documenting the property and another year plus preparing and refining the nomination. <clears throat> I'm a pretty tough cookie when it comes to deciding if a property is historically significant. I always start with the assumption that the property is not historically significant and only change that opinion when the facts dictate otherwise. Presently, there are three owners of the historic property. CDCR owns the northerly part of the property, which you can see on our slide. The Navy owns the middle part of the property, and Norco College, a public community college, owns the southerly part of the property. I'm proud to say that the president of Norco College has expressed support for our nomination. On the other hand, both CDCR and the Navy oppose our nomination. We believe that to the extent we have opposition to the nomination, it really boils down to the simple reality that property owners typically do not want their properties listed on any historic register. CDCR opposes the nomination primarily on the grounds that it believes the proposed listing would be incompatible with their prison operations. They're also concerned that the temporary buildings may need to be altered or demolished in the future to meet health and safety standards. And of course, as you're aware, neither of these concerns can be, caused, can be used as factors for determining the eligibility of a property for the National Register. On a practical level, however, I would note that CDCR has operated a prison on the Norconian property for 56 years without making any substantial exterior changes to the buildings thereon. I would also note that the, the prison recently spent $6 million to bring the prison up to the standards of the American Correctional Associ Association of Accreditation for Adult Correctional Institutions and are now in compliance with those standards. <clears throat> now I'd like to address the Navy's concerns. We have a good working relationship with the Navy in all areas other than the recognition of the historical significance of the property. In this one arena, the Navy has consistently resisted all efforts to expand the boundaries of the existing National Register District. This baffles us because the Navy's property already includes National Register listed resources, and those not listed are in such close proximity to the listed resources that Section 106 review is required for essentially all exterior alterations. In any event, as you're all aware, historic preservation rules only require the Navy to consult in good faith. Other than that, there's no restriction on what they can do to their property. For the past three years, the City of Norco has sought the Navy's feedback on our evaluation and subsequent nomination. In all cases, the Navy's response has been, we do not comment on draft documents. Then at the last possible moment, the Navy issued a three-page letter and 10-page document containing some 32 negative comments regarding our nomination. By the time we received these comments, they were already in your hands. In any event, we have carefully examined the Navy's comments and have found all to be unfounded. Many are at odds with easily verifiable facts in the nomination. Others are based on inaccurate interpretations of Bulletin 15. Finally, about a week, and a half, week after the nomination had been submitted to the SHRC, the Navy agreed to meet with us. Our message to the meeting at that Navy was that we value their presence in Norco, that we are baffled and disappointed in their opposition to the nomination and their prior refusal to discuss the nomination with us, and that we want to work with them to preserve what's important while facilitating needed improvements. 
We invited the Navy to join us in supporting this nomination. Unfortunately, to date, that support has not been forthcoming. I cannot possibly address all 32 of the Navy's comments in these 20 minutes. For a detailed response, I'll refer you to my 19-page response, written response. Today, I will discuss a small number of the Navy's concerns. Let's begin with integrity. As you know, no property can qualify for the National Register unless it retains integrity to its historic period. And here the Navy uh, claims that changes to the historic landscape, loss of buildings and structures, alterations to former TB Ward buildings and new construction have reduced the integrity of the property to such an extent that it can no longer convey its history. In answer to this concern, I would first point out that the property is being nominated at the historic district level. Uh, quoting from Bulletin 15, uh, what is important uh, for an historic district is that it conveys a visual sense of the overall historic environment. Alterations that not, do not impact the overall appearance of the property are not relevant. Slide six contrasts an aerial view of the property during World War II and one taken recently. Notice the amazing similarity in the overall pattern of development. Slide seven contains more detailed views of unit one buildings. As you can see, there are no significant differences. Slide eight compares an aerial view of unit two to its appearance today. While these photos reveal the removal of a few buildings and the addition of a few replacements, the bulk of the property remains intact. Slide nine reveals the most noticeable alteration to the TB wards. On the left, you can see that the uh, TB wards during World War II had glass frontages between their supporting columns. On the right, you will notice that the glass frontages have been removed and replaced with solid walls having much smaller windows. This alteration was made in 1951 when the TB wards were converted to guided missile laboratories. This alteration is not significant at the historic district level. But even at the individual building level, this alteration does not significantly disrupt the overall architectural scale, massing, and proportions of the buildings. In slide 10, we see aerial views of unit three with a World War II view on the left and a current view on the right. You will notice that there are no significant differences between these photos. The main difference is the presence of modular buildings in today's campus that were not present during World War II. Slide 11 shows close-up views of Unit 3's hospital wards with a World War II view on the left and a current view on the right. Uh, notice that the buildings are essentially unchanged. Significance. Now let's talk about significance. As you know, as long as a property retains integrity to its historic period, only one factor and one criteria needs to be proven for the property to qualify for the National Register. We have identified 13 factors spanning two criteria. My time is limited. I can only address a small number of these factors. Let's start with Criterion A, events. The Navy questions the significance of Naval Hospital Corona, NHC, as a regional and national center for the treatment of specified medical conditions. NHC was the Pacific Theater Center for the treatment of tuberculosis, polio, and cord bladder issues, and it was the National Center for Rheumatic Fever. The Navy says this is meaningless, but we strongly disagree. Being designated a regional national center is significant in and of itself. It signifies that NHC had the best doctors, the best facilities, and the best program for research, testing, and treatment of, of the specified medical conditions. So let's look at some specifics. Tuberculosis. The Navy asserts that tuberculosis was not a major cause of mandates during World War II. Well, I would hope so. The nomination clearly documents that in World War II, induction procedures required every inductee to be given a chest x-ray to keep the numbers of TB-infected personnel to a minimum. You can imagine if everybody in the country got a chest x-ray, uh, what that would, would have done to the numbers of TB patients of, uh, in, in the civilian population. Nonetheless, TV still managed to infect significant numbers of Navy and Marine personnel, and the work accomplished at NHC using the miracle drugs penicillin and streptomycin advanced the treatment, uh, advanced the effectiveness of treatment significantly. Rheumatic fever. Interestingly, the Navy's comments make no reference to rheumatic fever, a disease that was a major cause of last, lost mandates during World War II. Thousands of patients were included in research studies at NHC with the result that 95% cure rate was achieved and only 14 patients were lost to death. Wheelchair basketball. 
The Navy questions the significance of wheelchair basketball at NHC. While we acknowledge that wheelchair sports as a rehabilitation technique was pioneered in Great Britain, wheelchair basketball was pioneered in the United States during World War II. Of the three institutions that pioneered wheelchair basketball, only NHC survives to this day. And more importantly, its gymnasium, where the first ever basketball game between two paraplegic teams was played, retains excellent integrity to, to World War II, as does the overall hospital campus in which the gym is, is situated. Wheelchair basketball today is one of the most significant paraplegic sports in the world. And only one place survives to tell the story of that sport, and that place is NHC. Local involvement. <clears throat> The Navy says the status of NHC is the most significant influence on the economy and social practices of the Corona and Ochre communities doesn't make the property National Register eligible. They condemn that any major employer could be singled out as the most important factor in the culture and economy of an area. Well, there's a big difference here. NHC is also a rare surviving example of a historic property type that retains significant integrity to its historic form. As a resort, the Norconian property was essentially nothing more than a mansion on the hill. Generally, the only locals that ever stepped foot on the property were maids, servants, and other service providers. When the property was converted to a naval hospital, it suddenly became a major source of income for depression-strapped local businesses and a major stimulus for social change. Here are a few examples. The Navy Mothers and Red Cross Ladies, both uh, local volunteer groups, log thousands of hours at NHC in support of its staff and patients. Corona High School's Coronets helped patients and staff at NHC feel just a little less lonely through their dances and spaghetti dinners. Corona's volunteer run USO gave patients and staff a place to find recreation, moral support, entertainment, and a bite to eat. <clears throat> Racial segregation. The Navy says the impacts of NHC in breaking the back of deeply embedded Ku Klux Klan influenced local practices is not enough to qualify the property for the National Register. We strongly disagree. This image that you see before you right there, that's actually a postcard that you could have bought at any drugstore in Corona or Norco. So you could choose between the postcard showing orange trees or the postcard showing the local KKK. It, that really does, um, I think, uh, illustrate the degree to which these people were accepted in the local, lo local area. These guys ruled the roost at Corona and Norco before NH NHC appeared on the scene. If you were Hispanic and wanted to swim at the local pool, sorry, only on Thursdays, just prior to being drained and cleaned. Black, well, you're barred from the pool entirely. Hungry and want to bite to eat at a local restaurant? Sorry, we only serve whites. NHC made the perpetrators of this kind of bigotry scatter like cockroaches as opposed to light when its command threatened to make the local communities off limits to patients and staff unless they served everyone equally. Guided missile evaluation. The Navy's comments fail to recognize that our nomination focuses on detachment corona significance as a guided missile evaluation facility, leaving the matter of the, of the property significance as a research, development, testing, and evaluation facility for a later nomination effort. Detachment Corona's accomplishments as a guided missile evaluation facility are both groundbreaking and unduplicated anywhere else in Navy history. U.S. guided weapons had a notorious weapon of unreliability going back to the tor torpedoes of World War II. In combat, this wasn't just a technical issue. It was a matter of life and death. The problem, too many levels of review. This might on its surface seem like a simple problem, and at, at its most basic level it was. However, changing the multi-step process took the courage and determination of one man who put his career on the line to stare down the entrenched bureaucracy and rewrite procedures for guided missile evaluations. Captain Eli T. Reich set the evaluation system on its ear when he put the scientists and engineers in charge of performing evaluations in direct communication with those in charge of directing needed changes. And it all happened at Detachment Corona in 1964. This system, which became known as FEMSAG, revolutionized the process of guided missile evaluations with the result that for the first time in history, our guided weapons began to work as they were intended, and our position as a Cold War leader was greatly enhanced. Now, how about architecture? The Navy questions the validity of the nomination's finding that NHC is a rare surviving example of a property type. 
Page 47 of Bulletin 15 covers that subject in detail, noting the importance of integrity and comparative information. We already know that NHC retains significant integrity, so what about comparisons? Okay, NHC is the only surviving World War II built naval hospital in the Western United States. It is one of only six World War II built naval hospitals in the whole country that survive intact. It is the only example of a private resort slash hotel property converted to a naval hospital that survives with the bulk of its World War II improvements intact. And finally, it is the only World War II naval hospital that was expanded and converted into a naval general hospital, all, all of the others being converted to naval convalescent hospitals. Work of the master. The Navy questions the notions that Claude Bielman was a master. They say that he was primarily known for his modern buildings in Los Angeles, and that NHC did not represent a phase in his practice. Interestingly, the initial survey that they did said he was primarily known for his Art Deco buildings and was washed up by the time he got to Naval Hospital Corona. Uh, this is a typical example of an incorrect Navy assertion that could, be, that could have been avoided with a simple fact check of the nomination. The nomination clearly shows that over a dozen of Bielman's buildings are listed on the National Register representing a broad range of styles. Do the National Register buildings on this slide represent an architect known primarily for his modern buildings? Clearly, NHC was a transitional phase in the evolution of Bielman's works between his earlier traditional and Art Deco styles and his later move to modern architecture. It was also Bielman's only major project in the Spanish colonial revival style. Clearly, this property was significant then and it is significant now. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, proponents still have one minute, 47 seconds. They'd like to use that time. None? All right, can we reset the clock? Uh, first speaker for opposition is, oh. Um, we have three speakers for opposition, so just make sure you use your time accordingly. Um, David Daly? David Daly, yes sir, thank you. Thank you, David. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, um, Ms. Palancho, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Bailey, and I, I'm obviously representing the U.S. Navy. My colleagues with me today, um, Mr. Alex Benke, will be presenting the details of the Navy's um, determination. However, I am here on behalf of Captain Dalkey, who is the commanding officer of the installation of the Naval Weapons Station Seal Beach Detachment, NORCO. And also with us today in the audience is Captain Braunbeck, who is the commanding officer of the Naval Weapons Support Center, Corona Division, which performs the ongoing mission there. Um, and it is the purpose of the base. And although we understand that the mission and operational needs of the Navy, including future needs such as renovation, replacement, or new construction, is not considered with regard to eligibility, the Navy would nonetheless like to make an opportunity to make you aware that this is very much a very active military base and supporting an ongoing essential mission. There's only a couple of points that I would like to uh, express, if I may. Uh, Firstly, and I think one area that we're in uh, complete agreement on with the city and Mr. Wolpin is that regardless of the outcome, uh, we remain committed to work together with the community. I know that our COs and our staff have many issues that we work cooperatively with on them. And uh, that includes historic uh, properties preservation for the things that are uh, currently listed and uh, whatever that may outcome may be, we'll continue to work in that regard. Um, however, at this time, and in consideration of the uh, analysis that was done with, uh, by our historians, it is the Navy's position um, that we must object uh, to the listing and respectfully but strongly disagree with the assessment. Um, my role as the environmental director is, on a day-to-day -day basis is to work with the SHPO staff, with the community, um, and with the Navy to ensure that we're integrating historic property concerns with the actions that we do, that we're engaging the community, um, and that we're following the process and, and uh, fulfilling our stewardship requirements. And I believe that the Navy has done that. Um, specifically, I believe that we have a very robust Section 106 process, and I'm not talking about the formal consultations, I'm really talking about the day-to-day -day interactions that Lisa and Bill may have in discussing an upcoming project 
or the routine meetings that we have with the city, uh, providing information about upcoming projects and the like. Um, I also believe that we fulfilled our obligations as Alex is about to come up here and go through in detail that we've done as, uh, as staff had read into the record, the numerous studies and evaluations and I firmly believe that the Navy's applied fairly and with integrity the appropriate criteria in this case. So um, the only thing that we can ask obviously is that the commission evaluate what's presented and uh, draw their own conclusions and we appreciate very much your time and attention to this matter. Thank you. Alex. Yes. Good morning, commission members and Shippo Polanco and happy birthday, vice chair. Uh, according to Bob's rules, I need to sing uh, at the end of my presentation. So, okay, no, no need. My name is Alex Bethke and I'm the Cultural Resources Program Manager for Navy Region Southwest. And with me today, I have my colleague, Dr. David Sproul, uh, who will be providing our uh, rebuttal later on. Um, I would like to begin by saying that as a public historian by training, uh, it's nice to see such uh, enthusiastic involvement from the local community. Uh, as you are well aware, all Navy installations have a proud history of supporting the nation uh, in both war and peace. Um, as well as deep ties to their local community. And Detachment Norco is certainly no different. To begin, I would like to simply convey that the Navy has been seriously studying the eligibility of uh, Detachment Norco and its properties for over a decade. Um, my predecessors and I went through painstaking efforts, uh, which first included even just a basic research design to make sure that we had all of our facts straight and all of the, the, uh, uh, the sources cited um, so that we could uh, fairly, completely, and professionally evaluate the properties at Detachment Norco. We involved interested parties at every step, uh, including reviews of draft documents, and we even uh, reviewed over 7,000 digital uh, documents that were provided by um, interested parties. After a four-year consultation, SHPO also concluded that no additional properties were NR are NRHP eligible. Since the SHPO's concurrence, appeals have been made to the state, Senate, congressional offices, uh, and even the ACHP. Uh, all looked into the Navy's efforts and uh, concluded that the Navy's uh, uh, evaluations and, and determinations were, uh, were legitimate. Um, this also included um, a letter from um, Chairman Donaldson uh, supporting the Navy's position in 2016, notably after uh, the city had um, uh, submitted their own nomination. So while the Navy greatly appreciates the city's passion and efforts, there are several methodological issues with the nomination that present the Navy from supporting it. This is not based on a difference of opinion in facts, but on basic historical methodology. First and foremost, the nomination purports to equate historical significance, uh, I'm sorry, his, equate historical occurrences and functionality with NRHP significance. The Navy does not deny that the function and mission of Corona were important, but, they, but that could be said of every installation because every installation serves its function within the United States Navy. All are critical to the operation, but they are not and cannot be afforded the same status under the National Register. To this end, the nomination is a detailed historical account, which serves as, as a documentary purpose, uh, but, la but it lacks the contextual analysis, focus, and application of criteria for, uh, for our NRHP necessary purposes. The result is a, is a dilution of historical signif significance that is frankly dangerous to preservation in general. Beginning with the overarching issue throughout, the nomination lacks the contextual analysis that is a fundamental and essential part of studying history in order to evaluate significance. By definition, significance is something sets something above the rest, which can only be determined by knowing what the rest is. This is required by Bulletin 15, but lacking in the present nomination. 
As a result, the claimed statements of significance, again, do not answer the so what question. By contrast, the Navy's studies provided the critical element. It's also important here to state that the Navy did not look at these property types uh, in a vacuum. And what has not yet been said this morning or brought up is the statewide historic context statement for California historic buildings. Um, this study uh, was conceived of by Hans Kreuzberg in this SHPO office uh, and supported by the SHPO um, as a, an overall inventory context and guideline for evaluating California's wide breadth of, cal of military buildings. Yet to an extreme, the present nomination ignores these standard practices. The properties of Detachment Norco fall into four categories of property types for the relevant periods in time. With each one, the study discounts the population of buildings at Norco, and for good reason. In context, they don't hold up to the other examples of, uh, of their property type in California. So just a few ex uh, of the more pronounced contextual shortcomings. Number one, NHC was the central hospital in World War II's Pacific Theater for the medical research into and the treatment of tuberculosis. And with a little bit of additional context, we find out as a, quote, home hospital, Corona wasn't even the largest in Southern California, as we've already heard. Uh, moreover, BUMED's own documentation states that it was the developments made on the front line that were, in fact, medical, uh, medically significant uh, in World War II. In this light, being the center of tuberculosis or any other affliction is irrelevant. Detachment Corona, number two, Detachment Corona is unique in naval history as the birthplace of a nationwide center for naval guided missile evaluation. Again, with a little bit of additional context, we learned the laboratories were located in Norco purely because of their association with the R&D um, community in Southern California, which was prominent during the Cold War. And yes, there was, of course, important work being done in Norco, but this only comprised a small component of a weapons development system that was taking place nationwide. NHC, number three, NHC was an important work of master architect Claude Bielman and his only major commission in the Spanish colonial revival style. So the Navy acknowledges Claude Bielman uh, at, is a master architect, but his body of work for which he is considered a master uh, completely contrasts his work at Norco. Indeed, he was one of the leading Art Deco and modern architects on the West Coast. Over a dozen of his buildings are listed on the National Register. And these photos illustrate what a Claude Bielman building looks like and why he is considered to be a master architect. And this spans his entire career through Art Deco and modern. As you can tell, these largely high-rise, ornate, modern buildings greatly differ from the low-rise, comparatively plain and Spanish colonial revival style at Norco that deviates from all of his previous work. It was not uncommon for the offices of notable architects to take on these projects during World War II. There was lots of work to be had, and, every, and all hands were needed on deck to support the war effort. The fact that these buildings were designed by the offices of a master and conflicted with his entire body of work before or after represents nothing more than an anomaly, likely for reasons unrelated to style. And to say that the Spanish colonial revival style served as a transition between Art Deco and Modern is nonsensical to architectural historians. Without a context in which to place the events and buildings at Norco, the nomination is left to make associations of significance um, that are merely assertions. Under criterion A, representing broad patterns in history, the nomination makes no fewer than 13 claims of significance. It has the effect of throwing everything at the board and seeing what sticks. Unfortunately, none of the associations are significant uh, or represent broad patterns in history. Here, the claims for significance rely on a broad number of qualifiers that assert but don't prove significance. 
The reality is that these do not represent significant associations within the broader uh, themes when Bulletin 15 clearly states that, quote, mere association with historic events or trends is not enough. The property's specific association must be well documented. Instead, the nomination cites the number of doctors, the hospital as a center for medical treatment, the largest of this, the most unique of that, et cetera, et cetera. However, there is no contextual analysis provided to make these associations significant. Saying repeatedly that NHC had significant associations with other clinics or hospitals does not, does not automatically make it significant. Calling the guide and missile evaluation function national register significant over and over does not make it significant unless that association is explained and evaluated. Under criterion C, the nomination makes another five claims for significance. Here too, the claims are merely associative, uh, but they do not provide supporting analysis to assess why their design and or construction value merits NRHP eligibility. Rather, these claims are tied once again to qualifiers like rarity, which itself is only applicable to integrity. To be clear, the last of an insignificant example does not elevate it to significant. Here too, without the necessary context, the nomination incorrectly assumes therefore um, and asserts that mere associations, whether they be with World War II, a master architect, thoughtful architectural design, or ubiquitous temporary buildings are significant in and of themselves. We've already established that neither naval hospitals nor Claude Bielman in this context uh, are significant. Another place where this misapplication is shown uh, is temporary military buildings. The nomination fails to mention that there is an existing historical context that was completed as a programmatic mitigation of World War II temporary military buildings exactly because this building type was so common and that their historical significance could be essentially discounted uh, and um, discounted and through Section 106 consultation. And this is brought up um, purely to mention that uh, these buildings have been considered for their eligibility on a nationwide level. The, uh, the Navy is not making a case about um, their eligibility per the programmatic MOA. In context, there were 26,000 World War II uh, era temporary buildings DOD-wide in the early 1990s. Today, there are, remain over 2,500 temporary World War buildings in the Navy alone and 1,000 in the Southwest. There is nothing rare about temporary, temporary World War II military buildings. <coughs> So without significance, integrity is really beside the point. It's to convey a property's significance. But let's play devil's advocate and assume that these buildings had significance. There are numerous issues with, the, with just the basic integrity of the nomination's proposal. And honestly, uh, you've already heard them this morning. Um, the nomination adds 23 contributors and 113 non-contributors. Certainly, there's no magic number. but Frankly, at any municipal level or preservation planning uh, methodology, uh, that represents a gross uh, mis misapplication of preservation um, standards. Fundamentally, a district is defined as a, quote, significant concentration, linkage, or continuity. But this cannot happen if four of every five buildings or structures detracts rather than adds to the statement of significance. Looking at the buildings a little closer, there are additional issues with integrity. This stems from the complex nature of buildings that have been used and altered over time. The best example are the hospital ward porches that served a very real and important function uh, with convalescents at the hospital. And again, this is a little bit repetitive, but this photo shows the Naval Hospital Corona in 1945. You can clearly see the open air porches surrounding the buildings. But these were enclosed to create research laboratories during the Cold War. So we have a, an issue of um, 
uh, overlapping or, or contrasting periods of significance and functions that had an impact, uh, admittedly, on, um, on the building's integrity. The alteration of such features, as well as the form and materials of many of the Unit 2 buildings, constitutes a loss of integrity of design, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association that precludes eligibility. More to the point of preserving history, the nomination does not clearly relate how these buildings convey the importance of an event or group of individuals. For example, how do these buildings convey uh, the number of Mayo Clinic doctors present? or the impact to race relations. The reality is they don't. While, while this nomination represents a detailed history of the property, it does not meet the basic requirements of the National Register program. Thank you. Dr. David Sproul, two minutes left. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be presenting the rebuttal. Very well. Any other opponent <coughs> wish to speak during this time? No? Okay, we can stop the clock and start a five-minute rebuttal for proponent. Uh, I think when we read Bulletin 15, um, we were reading different documents because I didn't recognize most of the issues that were raised. Um, I will say that um, your professional staff, the work who worked with me very closely on this nomination, found that we made our case in all, uh, in all areas. Um, only the Navy and the CDCR are opposed to the nomination, and their, their opposition is purely from a property owner's perspective. Um, uh, the, um, Mr. Bethke mentions the statewide context study. We did look at that in detail, and one of the things that is said in the statewide context study that uh, standalone naval hospitals are significant. The statewide study also says the reason that there haven't been any uh, naval hospitals uh, determined eligible for the National Register is that most of them are temporary and have long since been demolished. Uh, let's see. Uh, they make the point that detachment corona was only a small part of the overall RDT and E effort of the um, guided missile evaluation function. We are only talking about guided missile evaluations, and guided missile evaluations is specifically associated with the detachment corona, and specifically um, still is on that site to this day, and is, and is the only, um, is, is the only um, example of that type of, um, of operation anywhere else in the Navy. I'm also rather disturbed and surprised that Mr. Bethke mentions that I have not addressed context um, there is so much context in that document that um, it just it's, it's mind-boggling. We've got 17 pages of resources that we that we referenced in that book, in that uh, nomination, including numerous um, primary sources. Um, I don't think too many people have dug up letters that were actually written during World War II between the commanding officer and BUMED and other people to find out exactly what was going on in that time. Um, <clears throat> also, Mr. Bethke says we didn't address the uh, memorandum of, of understanding or of agreement regarding temporary buildings. Again, that's simply factually not true. The, the documentation is very extensive in its discussion of that MOA. And one of the points that it makes is that um, um, the detachment corona or the, the, the unit two buildings um, are not owned by the Department of Defense and therefore they're not subject to that, to that uh, memorandum of, of agreement. Uh, let's see, what else? The non-contributing buildings, they talk about the percentage of non-contributing to contributing. The non-contributing buildings are mostly modular buildings that were put down by the state prison. These are buildings that could as easily be plugged in as they are plugged out as they were plugged in. They don't detract from the overall integrity of the property. We think that integrity is important, and we, I think it's very important to, um, to recognize that we're talking about integrity at the district level. We're not talking about individual buildings. We're talking about the overall 
visual ability of the property to convey a sense of integrity. And I think that's probably all I have to say about that. Thank you. Well, I think you can see in the, in the top slide, um, uh, which shows the, um, the annex, the uh, annex building to the hospital and the, uh, more toward the right-hand side of the slide. I think you can see the influences of modern architecture in that building. Bielman was not strictly designing in the Spanish colonial revival style. He was designing in a, in a transitional style between Spanish colonial revival and modern. And, and those modern uh, features do show up in the building as quite prominent. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? 30 seconds. No, why don't we reset the clock and have opposition rebuttal? Five minutes, please. Good morning, uh, Honorable Commission, uh, Shippo Polanco. Uh, my name is David Sproul. Uh, I am currently a cultural resources manager and historian uh, attached to Navy Region Southwest. I work on a daily basis with uh, Alex Bethke. Uh, prior to coming to work for the Navy in 2008, uh, I taught history at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, uh, both public history and public history methodology, uh, and left that career to uh, go to work for the federal government and be of service to the Department of Defense and the Department of the Navy. Um, I am quite proud of our track record uh, as a cultural resources management division. And so my rebuttal will focus primarily on two statements made by Mr. Wilkman uh, that quite frankly have very little to do with the details of the nomination, the comments presented to the commission about that nomination, and the rebuttal comments to the comments made to the commission about that nomination, because why would I want to bore you? So the primary comment that, that caught the Navy's attention uh, as Mr. Wilkman was speaking uh, was that um, we had become difficult to work with and resistant to commenting on their nomination during the developmental uh, period of that nomination. Uh, as far as the Navy knows, uh, as of 2014, 2015, uh, the buildings in question in this evaluation were not eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. That was the official position of both the SHPO and the ACHP documentation that's already been provided to this commission. Based on the lack of eligibility of that set of buildings, the Navy proceeds under its stewardship responsibilities relevant to 36 CFR 800 to treat those buildings as not eligible until such time as that set of facts changes. Last time anybody that I work with read 36 CFR 800, the Navy was not obliged to divert important resources in both time and effort to evaluate and, and consider comments on an evaluation that was not attached to an active consultation associated with some undertaking. The simple fact is that the city sought our input to make their nomination better, which to me seems perfectly insane. If we were asked to comment on every single evaluation that some private entity or municipality had about a Navy resource, we would be spending our time helping them do their jobs. If that resource is part of an active undertaking and the nomination is presented as part of some kind of consultation, the Navy would absolutely feel obliged to dedicate its resources to providing comments on that evaluation. But in point of fact, this is not what happened. So to call us uh, obstructionist in this case, I think escapes the facts. The second observation that I'd like to deal with is the statement that Mr. Wilkman made that property owners, by and large, do not want to have their properties listed or determined eligible for the National Register. I've been with the Navy for 10 years. I came on board at the same time that Alex did. In that time, I have seen the Navy inventory of eligible resources grow from just under 200 to 453 buildings. Those eligibility determinations were made under contracts administered by myself and Alex over the last decade. We have never once, nor been asked ever once, by a single commander or business line team leader, environmental division head, or anybody at the SECNAV or secretariat level to uh, resist in any way the eligibility determination provided by a contracted entity about a Navy resource. 
In point of fact, we simply look at eligibility recommendations made by our properties contracted by our office, which overwhelmingly in the last 10 years have looked at properties and determined them eligible. In 17 different task orders that Alex and I have run over the last decade, only two have come back and recommended resources not eligible for the National Register. So to say that we are resistant to the idea that uh, eligibility or listing on the National Register is somehow anathema to our mission is simply a misstatement of the truth. In point of fact, the Navy actively regards its mission as a steward of National Register eligible properties as part and parcel of its overall mission. There are numerous Navy instructions, operational naval guidances, uh, and, and various other executive orders that compel us as a matter of, of mission to consider and actively manage our resources around the eligibility determinations made for those resources. So rather than leave this forum with the commission potentially biased by the idea that the Navy is not an active steward, I would like to simply rebut that assertion. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Sproul. It beeps. That's great. Okay. Um, that ends the public comment period, and we will now go to commission discussion. Anybody would like to start? I actually have a question for staff. If you could maybe, I know that when you made the um, presentation, there was the comment that, you know, even though there had been a previous 106, that doesn't preclude more information coming forward. But could you maybe summarize that process again, um, you know, in terms of, you know, concurrence from SHPO office and, you know, what's, I mean, is it in fact, point of fact that, you know, you really feel like you have way more information than you did during the previous determinations? Um, I do not work with Section 106 review, so I really cannot comment on how that process goes forward. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, in preparing for the, the nomination, um, I consulted with a Section 106 staffer, and the Navy met its required obligations, and the SHPO responded to the information presented with, uh, that, that was provided to them, and they concurred at the time with the Navy's findings. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, this does not preclude a later finding of eligibility if different, different information is put forward. Does that answer the question? I actually have one more question. Um, okay. Okay. Um, just with regard to um, the process moving forward, that two signatories are required before this is forwarded to the keeper. Yes. Can the Navy deny signing? Yes. Okay. So just to be clear, the process is, should this body determine in the affirmative for eligibility, then it comes to my desk, I forward it to the Navy, and then the Navy has their obligation under the law. Okay, well I had a comment here. Um, so this, this commission um, uh, hears a lot of comments about folks, basically people who, who oppose um, uh, nominations. Um, and um, many of those comments are not really relevant to the process that um, we're engaged in here. They deal with things that are not particularly relevant to what we're obligated to do. So I just wanted to um, commend uh, the Navy's um, um, critique of the document. Alex, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, because they clearly, you know, they understand the process. And that's, that's so important, right? He wasn't coming out with stuff that was completely irrelevant. Frankly, I didn't agree with your conclusions. But I really appreciate a well-constructed argument coming up from somebody who knows what they're talking about. So I want to thank you, thank you for that. So your, um, uh, your um, uh, testimony was not wasted on me, even though, I, as I said, I don't agree with the conclusion. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I also have comments, and I agree with uh, Dr. Pretzelis' uh, comment that uh, we are in the, in the company of very qualified proponents and opponents, and we can only really look at the nomination, uh, deliberate amongst ourselves, look back into our own knowledge of history for that much sought after uh, perspective. And that's that's where I where, that's where I start. Um, so I, I think we have a very difficult job uh, because of the high level of of uh, of, uh, of concepts being bandied about. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to convey my own my own um, <clears throat> uh, points of view. Um, th this country. Um, uh, this first comment is, comes from a, another hat I wear uh, that's at the national level. Uh, it's irrelevant. You don't have to know what, what it is. But it gives me um, uh, more, more, more of a national perspective. And from that, I gather uh, that this country respects and honors its military to a, to a really remarkable degree. We care about the, uh, the military. We care about equipping them and, and making sure that they have everything they, they, they have. And uh, that includes installations and, and, and physical uh, property, et cetera. And um, from a historic preservation uh, perspective, I've, I've been present where uh, in, in, in procedures where uh, places like uh, the site where radar was invented becomes a National Historic Landmark. Uh, even places like, that are really single function places, like for instance, VA hospitals. What's special about a VA hospital? Well, a lot of people were saved, a lot of people rehabilitated. A single use, yet they, they attain National Historic Landmark status. What we have in front of us is a incredibly complex site that has had many, many uses and many different uh, tasks and, and many, many different personalities. And on top of this, it, it corresponds with one of the more, most uh, heroic periods in our history, you know, nothing less than the, uh, the rescue of the world during, during World War II. So this is big and meaningful. And I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the, of the complexities and the profundity of this whole, this whole thing. But back to the nomination, and with, uh, in advance, I, I, I have to, um, well, I'm not going to apologize for my thoughts, but I'm going to tell you I'm going to disappoint uh, our fine gentleman from the Navy. I think the nomination is actually reasonable. And I also know that no nomination is complete. They all have, they all have issues, and it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of ascribing, is this enough? Is this reasonable? Does this pass the smell test? So in reading the nomination, I was agreeing through most, most of, the, of the discussion. And I think on, on the matter of integrity, let me, let me tell you how I slice and dice it. We're in the presence of a resource that is actually captures the story of preservation through building adaptation. So really, integrity with a capital I is not really, it's not really what I, what I would propose important. I think Norco Detachment is a story of how we've, we've treated historic uh, military properties as the tasks have evolved. So the fact that something is no longer a ward or a kitchen or whatever is not important to me. Um, the fact that the overall general integrity aspects of location, the appearance, et cetera, they're still there, that's enough. That's, for my, for my money, that's enough. I am also convinced of the of, of the um, significance of the of the resource 
based on denomination and based on letters of support that come from people that work there that say, yes, 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 this, this, uh, this site was important to the development of military weapon systems, et cetera, et cetera. And on the matter of architectural merit, you can't drive down to major Los Angeles avenues without bumping into Claude Bielman. He is quite simply a master architect. And a lot of them, especially in early in the career of, of, of uh, Bielman, before we totally embraced modernism, they were functioning as well-trained stylists. They were, they were functioning as eclectic architects, that if they bumped into bumped into a, a property owner that wanted, you know, high tutor for a boys' school or a mansion, they could deliver this without going through, without twisting themselves into, into aesthetic pretzels. They could, they could just deliver all manner of styles. So um, my favorite Bielman buildings are in the, in the zigzag modern, yes, but he also went into the 60s and did stuff that you would, you would say that's a canonical, canonical modernism. The fact that he was, I will agree with the proponent that said that he was functioning, uh, in the case of, of Norco detachment, he was functioning in the transitional style, much like you would say Union Station in Los Angeles is transitional between the Mission Revival and Art Modern. So um, I will repeat that I find the, the amendment reasonably argued and I can support it. I think this nomination is extremely important because it helps, it helps us interpret Norco as a place of profound transformations and profound skills in adapting to other times as, as, as times went on. So I, I think the public and the historic preservation community needs uh, needs properties like Norco to to interpret uh, history and the history of our military. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hoyas. And um, I would just like to piggyback on what you had to say about the significance of um, Lake Norco in its development of, as a weapon system, uses as a, as a hospital the study of tuberculosis, but I want to address uh, another issue, and that has to deal with the issue of public history. And we have several public historians in our audience, and thank you very much. Um, there was a lot said about historical context, or the lack of historical context, in terms of this nomination. Uh, public history, as we know, um, tells the story, or purports to tell the story of history from the bottom up. Official historians, such as military history, uh, are often told from, are viewed as being told from the top down. But attachments to properties, um, buildings are in association with other kinds of activities are, are very important. And they're often based on emotional experiences, lived experiences on those properties, or the association that living people have, and they will tell you about those experiences. That makes the role, I think, of the federal government um, that's been revealed in this um, nomination to reverse or to suppress uh, local discriminatory practices are not insignificant. In this case, we're talking about discrimination in this area against African Americans and Latino Americans which was not insignificant. And anyone who's read um, Isabel Wilkerson's Warmth of Other Sons will know that there's a section in her book where she talks about traveling up Route 66 and how difficult that was for African Americans in this particular area. Um, and so that makes the role of the federal government helping to bring down those walls, albeit slowly, if, depending on what side of the fence you're on, um, that was a very important thing. And in fact, probably, I'd say at least up to 30 years ago maybe, if you travel in that area in the Inland Empire and you pass through like Fontana 
Well, we called it Fun Tucky. <laughs> that should give you an idea of how important that was. So I just want to say that that's not an insignificant factor in considering also the eligibility of this property and, and for the nomination. So I would just like to add that to what we had to say about the appropriateness of the criteria, Mitch. Thank you. So having a background in archaeology, I rely a lot on the very intelligent words of my fellow commissioners as they apply their knowledge to this type of property. The, the difficulty that I had with the nomination is, in fact, um, how complex it was, much like everybody has agreed to, in that through the natural progression of research and putting the nomination together, 13 factors were identified, and, and you only need one. Right, so the others came up as part of research in, in documenting and putting the nomination together. Um, as a result, my review is based on the mechanics of the nomination and whether it serves the purpose under the bulletin and, and what it was meant to do as far as convey historical significance. For that, I'll bring up a couple of examples and uh, the caveat stands that I'm not a public historian, but at the same time, my concerns are thus. Um, under Criterion A, the significance of association states, and, and we've heard this both in rebuttal and in just normal public comments and up here, that um, mere association with historic events or trends is not enough in and of itself to qualify under Criterion A. The property's specific association must be considered important as well. For example, a building historically in commercial use must be shown to have been significant in commercial history. Uh, taking that into consideration, as I read the nomination, I found that the historical facts that were presented from both research and oral history didn't, for me, associate with historic events, but rather conveyed historic facts. And I think the overall picture adds to the nomination's significance, but it goes back to, of the 13 factors, do all of them apply? And if they don't, what do we do about that? If, if one of them is a stretch, where do we take the nomination from there? Um, specifically, I was not convinced in reading under the social history component, specifically race relations, that the Navy Hospital Corona Executive Officer and his request to serve hospital patrons and patients and staff who are of minorities makes it to a significant level as far as the National Register goes. Um, was the property in itself associated with Nettie Whitcomb's actions to desegregate the Corona plunge? Or was this more of a pattern of desegregation as social history moves through the area during the war effort? There's a concluding statement in page 117 of the nomination that says, the NHC puts a major dent in the attitudes and practices of the community and moved race relations needle significantly in the direction of tolerance and acceptance, but then goes on to state that Black teachers were not hired until the 60s, and deed restrictions prevented them from getting housing. As well, the Mexican school was kept in place until the early 60s. So I'm having a hard time making an association between a needle moving significantly and then having another 20 years of segregation in the school system. And, and how does that equate to historical significance and association as stated in Criterion A? Correcting the misidentification of Native Americans versus Mexicans does not elevate a property to historical significance. It demonstrates the tolerance over time, but did the property do that? And my comment is that the, the nomination in this area does not say that. It identifies the research, it identifies the oral history, but it doesn't make the association um, which puts me in a, a weird spot because in my view, 
there is one of 13 factors that is deficient. And I think overall, the property does meet criteria, but I think the mechanics of the nomination, uh, there are some shortcomings there. And when you swing for the fences and end up with 13 factors that identify a property's historical significance, that comes with the risk of, again, using a term that I was going to use before you took it, dilutes the pool of significance over time. And that's the risk of creating a 260-page nomination and perhaps being more selective and drawing more association to historical significance as well as the factors identified in the nomination would have made a better nomination for the reader like myself. That's my comment. Any other discussion? Would you like me to ask legal a question? I would love for you to ask legal a question. Thank you. Okay. Um, Tara, could you please make a comment to uh, Chairman Shiro's statement that if one of the 13 in his mind doesn't rise to the level of significance to make the nomination eligible for the National Register, what are the options of the commission? In, in the past, this commission has, on the dais, stricken parts of the nomination. Um, I actually don't recommend that process. I think that if the commission believes that the nomination doesn't, doesn't on itself um, make the argument to meet the criteria and you don't feel comfortable forwarding the nomination on to the SHPO for forwarding on to the Navy and then ultimately the keeper, then um, you can make a motion that would give direction to the applicant as to how a, a nomination could come forward that you could support. Um, or you can make the decision that um, you know, it, it, it is there and that you can you know, make a vote on the nomination today. So does that make sense? I, I see it. It does. OK. Three options. One, I don't recommend. One, go back to the applicant and have them revise the application, and then third, um, take the vote today. You know, whether or not that vote is it meets it or does not meet it. And for the, thank you, by the way, for the, um, the situation in which the commission would send the nomination back to the preparer, what's the mechanism for doing that? It would still be a motion um, by, by this uh, commission. You're welcome. Yes, it does. I'm still not at a conclusion yet because okay. I don't want to be the guy. But at the same time, uh, engagement with the local community at the level that the nomination describes is, it makes me hesitant simply because I think there's more there. And the association could be drawn. The nomination just doesn't provide it. I'd like to hear what Commissioner Pretzelis has to say about that. <laughs> he's, he's looking at me very pointedly. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think Adam makes a really good, um, uh, makes a really good point there. Um, but um, another point is, uh, this is a 262-page nomination. Now, I've seen a lot of them come through this process. I don't think I've seen one this long. Um, and uh, you know, as Luis said, is is it going to be is it going to be everything? Is everything going to be everything you want in relation to all the elements? No, I, I don't I don't think so. And the question is, does the property convey its significance? That's the thing that that's that is always the question that comes back to my mind. Does it convey its significance uh, overall? Um, and even though um, I, I think that you're, I think that was a great point. And I'm really happy you said that, and you learned a lot from Anthro 503. He's my old professor. <laughs> I, I taught this for about 25 years. Anyway, it makes me feel good, man. Um, uh, I, I think it meets the smell test. To, just, just my, my opinion. 
this is it's a it's a massive document. Sure, but parts of it could have been better. Yeah, uh, well, pretty much everything I've done could have been better too. <laughs> but almost everything. Anyway, that's that's all I had to say. Thank Mr. you, Chairman. Uh, my own way of slicing and dicing that particular uh, shortcoming is to just look at the broad picture. Uh, what is criterion A? It's broad patterns of history. This extremely complex facility more than proves more than proved its role during the Second World War and thereafter. Enough to satisfy, based on a position of what, what would you call it, um, the preponderance of evidence. And I'm satisfied with that. No, I, I appreciate everybody's feedback, and I think that's, that helps me as I try to figure this out from my perspective, bringing whatever skills I have to this body. So, yes, Bill, I'm okay. sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that when I, I had some of those concerns as well in terms of all 13 areas and did it actually make the case, but I think I was doing more of what uh, Commissioner Hoyos was saying is rather than dividing it up by 13, looking at, you know, criterion A. Mm -hmm. And then there are many facets within criterion A and, and C as well. So I was kind of like trying to look more at the big picture than, than nitpicking at each of the specific 13. Sure. I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add that in response to Commissioner Hansen's earlier question as well as her just statement just now, the part of the process of this nomination was uh, editing and revision, and it was edited and revised very substantially from the time it was first received in order to improve its organization to make it more comprehensible because it is a complex property. And the fact there are 13 different areas identified, there's still really only four areas of significance. And so the social history is a multiple, is several different areas the medical history of several different areas. And um, also to highlight uh, the process as far as the Navy went, um, the community was, uh, they had, we had called our offices and several different people uh, asking for uh, clarification on why the Navy wasn't responding. And, and as the Navy a staff personnel here today pointed out they were not there was not a process that they could formally respond to so they did not so the the city put the nomination forward from the time the nomination was, was received the navy was very responsive they contacted us once the nomination was received they contacted us for regular updates regarding the schedule of the nomination and they did provide response to the no, the, the nomination draft when it was prepared uh, based on the legal requirements of, of this body and of nominations for National Register property. So I, I wanted to clarify that point because there, I think there was some comments and concerns from Navy staff about their um, execution of their responsibilities. This is a separate process uh, that they did follow. And um, as I said, this nomination changed quite a bit from its initial receipt to the form you see before you that hopefully makes it, it comprehensible. But yes, it's still, it's still a, a big district with many factors. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's who can build the argument and, and who builds the better argument. And there are a number of arguments in the document. And whether one argument is more compelling than the other, I, you know, do you, I look at the whole picture as well, and, and um, the details are what I got wrapped around. And, and I think that's a good point to make is that it's good to wrap yourself around the details on something like this, because what we're trying to do is important. And... Uh, the Navy had more of a compelling argument in certain aspects of their 10-page rebuttal than did the nomination, but then vice versa. If we were to send the nomination back, I already agree that there are aspects of the nomination that give the property historical integrity and should be forwarded on. So changing one piece of it doesn't change the overall outcome and would make it moot at that point. So I'm... I'm, I'm happy with the discussion, and I appreciate everybody's input. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a, uh, a motion. Please. I move that the State Historical Resources Commission support the determination that this amendment demonstrates the Lake Nor Norconian Club Historic District as eligible under National Register criteria A and C in the areas of health, medicine, military history, social history and art and architecture with a period of significance of 1929 to 1965. I further move that the State Historic Preservation Officer approve the amendment for forwarding to the Federal Preservation Officer, the United States Navy, 
for subsequent forwarding by the Navy FPO to the National Park Service for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, second that motion. Oh, oh she's, sorry. You're good. You're good. Go ahead. Is there a second? Yeah. I'm seconding. Roll call. Fred Zellis. Fred Zellis, aye. Hanson, aye. Sriro, aye. Oh, yes, aye. Moss, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was enlightening for me. All right. Um, we now have, we're moving on to National Register progress report, I believe. Okay, a uh, list of those properties listed on the National Register is included in the agenda. Um, we're now at a overall public comment period, so we'll now accept comments from the public on items not on the agenda, and the commission welcomes brief comments from the public, um, but cannot take any action on the non-agendized matters. I have no public comments. Oh, Chris no public me. comments listed. No. Commissioner comments, anything? I would like to comment on uh... part of the joy of serving on this uh, commission has been some of the interesting nominations that have come across um, our, our uh, you know across the table and, and a lot of them have joyfully been buildings that I, I knew as a, as a kid growing up in San Francisco and then seeing the women's building on 18th Street, which was a few blocks from where I grew up, is absolutely wonderful and a joy. Um, and we did entertain um, some years ago nominations on the moon, uh, Sacred Heart School and others, the Muni Bus Barn. And, you know, I grew up around all these areas, so it's really wonderful. But I want to commend the staff for the, the, the um, entertaining the proposal or the nomination for the Integraton, which is just absolutely wild. And, I, <laughs> and it really makes you sit up and take notice uh, of the kinds of properties that are out there and exist. And, and I do applaud your courage in presenting us with those. Uh, I enjoyed that one especially. Nice, isn't it? <laughs> so I, I will, thank you, I will, Chip. Thank you for that. I will just say that um, this is, this work that you all do so well um, and I appreciate your thoughtful deliberation and your consideration and your conversation I feel like um, you all take this role very seriously and you give it great thought and great consideration um, and I appreciate that you're um, th th in that you're willing to challenge us as well because we don't always get it right so I appreciate that deliberation and also we talk about these kinds of interesting nominations moon junk um, if you will, and then the obvious beautiful ones and iconic ones like Coit Tower and the Women's Building. Um, but I think that we have, it's uh, important for us to remember that it's a register that the pub, for the public and at their will. And if they decide that these are the types of resources they want to present, then it's your obligation, it's our obligation collectively to be sure that they're given daylight to be considered. Um, so thank you for that. I have a question uh, for for uh, Shippo Polanco. As a matter of um, curiosity and for information's sake, I know that you're busy and you coordinate things with, with Washington, kind of like, for instance, um, tracking the progress of nominations as they become put on the National Register. Uh, and I know that we're going through a very difficult period at, at the National Park Service. So I wondered if you could comment or give us a an update on how are relations between the two organizations? Uh, is is it business as usual? Um, I believe on a, a Chippo and staff level, yes. We have had, um, I may be speaking for staff out of turn, but we've had no difference in our working relationship on the National Register program, on the Historic Tax Credit program, mm -hmm. um, on our grant programs. We were very pleased to know that the underrepresented communities grants 
program continued this year and they were actually awarded in January for the next round. Um, and that there are some um, additional grants that are open. I believe there's an African American context statement or a history grant that's open. Um, so from our perspective, it's the same business as usual. We haven't seen any directives that tell us to operate differently. Um, at the moment, so we just are continuing on and slogging through and happily working together to make sure that these items do um, get recognized and commemorated and illustrated properly. Thank you for that very reassuring <laughs> statement. Any other discussion? All right, with that, I adjourn. Thank you, everyone.